the Daytona 200. Just saying those words and you conjure up memories of some of the greatest in motorcycle racing. Having been crowned champion from the first, Ed Kretz on the beach in 1937, to 2022's winner Brandon Posh on the high banks. Some of the biggest names in racing have filled victory lane over the years. Mann, Roberts, Lawson, Schwantz, Rainey, Aladdin, and Hayden, just to name a few. But two sit atop the all-time leaderboard with five wins apiece. Miguel Duhamel and Mr. Daytona, Scott Russell. But this weekend, history beckons. For one rider in this field has done it four times. Oklahoma's Danny Eslin. Can he join the elite on the top? Or will New Jersey's own Posh make it three in a row? With three past winners, five Moto America Medallia Superbike regulars lined it up, and a host of blazingly fast hopefuls get ready to do battle? It's anyone's guess who will be crowned 2023 champ. The World Center of Racing does it again for the 81st time in history, and it happens right now. A spectacular sunny Florida day. The stage is set for the Daytona 200 here at Daytona International Speedway. One of the most unique motorcycle races in all the world, right here in Daytona Beach, Florida. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the broadcast booth. I'm Greg White, standing alongside Jason Pridmore. Now, Jason, this race is exciting. It kicks off the season here in the U.S. It's the Daytona 200. It's unique, but JP, why is it so unique? Well, it's so prestigious and the amount of history that you have here, a who's who of names that have won this race, Greg, over the years. And last year when we were here, the weather was cold, it was rainy. It's the exact opposite this year. We're seeing a big field of riders and any one of 15 guys can really walk away with the victory today if circumstances fall their way. As for the Daytona 200, well, Here's some of the things that make it so unique. It's a solo endurance race, so it's 57 laps, and it's just one rider, one bike. It's a two-pit stop strategy for most teams, but Jason, drafting on the high banks is something that is just not done. It is pretty cool, and it is an AMA Pro race, but it's not a Moto America sanctioned race, which means we have a tire war. That means that Bridgestone is here, Pirelli's here, who's won it the last four years, and Dunlop going after it. Yeah, That's absolutely, and when you look at the run, yes, last year we had four riders Coming to the flag last year, those riders were Brandon Posh, Sheridan Marias, Cam Peterson, and Josh Hayes. And while we watched this, these replays, you could see Brandon Posh just played his cards close to his chest the whole time. He fought for this position off the final turn for banking. He was able to draft Cam Peterson at the line. Unfortunately, Greg, we're not going to see Sheridan Marias this week. He fell off on Thursday morning, broke his ankle, so he won't be here. But the rest of the players are here, and they need some revenge, and they want some revenge. And, of course, we saw those four riders go to the line there, and that's after two pit stops. But, Jason, this year the field seems deeper and a lot closer. Well, the prestige of the Daytona 200, I think, is definitely back. We have five superbike riders from our Moto America Championship that are here at this race. We cannot leave this guy out. Brandon Posh, three-time winner, four-time winner, going for number five. And you sit here and you look at Josh Heron again. 2010 was the last time he won this race. He's back. He had some bad luck last year. Camp Peterson. First time at Daytona ever last season. He lost by, what, half a bike length? So he's come back with Richard Stamboli and that attack crew. And we cannot forget this guy, Josh Hayes, looking for win number 87. Hasn't won the day two, Daytona 200. He's coming back from an injury that he suffered last year at Barber, if you remember there. So, again, Danny Eslick. Here's our four-time winner. Brandon Posh, sorry, had only won three. But, uh, but Danny Eslick is back. He's in that fold as well. Add to the list, there's a couple other guys that are, are going to be looking for. P.J. Jacobson, Richie Escalante, Ty Scott on the front row. Chavi Forez coming over from World Superbike. It's a who's who today of who can win this. All right, so let's take a look at pit stops because this is unique, at least up till this point. We're going to have some pit stops in Moto America this year. But, Jason, you're a two-time World Endurance champion. Here are the rules. So pit lane is 60 kilometers or 37 miles an hour. And tell us the rest of the rules. Well, you got six crew members that can be over. you got one dedicated to that tire extinguisher, fuel tires, repairs, and you got, you, you get, you're allowed the pneumatic tools. Now, Greg, the thing that's key about these pit lanes, uh, pit stops as well, are the riders in laps and their out laps, their fuel strategies. There's other things that we look at when we look at our screen right now that aren't on there. And those are just as big of a play. I've been watching riders go out of the pits here this week like their hair's on fire because they got to get ready for when they leave pit lane. 
And it's just as important when you see that pit inboard that you get to your crew as quickly as you can. As a rider, it's important that you stay calm and collected and do the best you can of not panicking your crew when you come in because that race can be won right there in the pits. Going fast is important, but it all it happens all in the pits in this race. We'll step away and we come back more from the Daytona 200 here at the World Center of Racing. Well, the prestige of this race is definitely back. We're actually hearing it, uh, a number of riders from overseas right now, including a few that have been racing in this series previously, uh, are paying close attention and watching things here. And, you know, let's look back real quick to last year. It was monsoon-like here for the most part. Uh, what a difference a year makes. I mean, this is about as nice a, a condition as it gets. And that just brings out even more energy and enthusiasm for these riders, let well, alone the crowd. I think also all the riders know that the track now is going to be in perfect condition. Yeah. And uh, they watch all the other classes to see their lap times to see how the track is from last night's rain. Every class so far today has went faster than yesterday. So all these guys know, even though the rain came last night, the track is perfect shape. It's not too hot. It's temp the temperature is perfect. So I think everybody knows it's uh, going to be a good race. And right now, it's just the butterflies are, are kicking in. They know the race is going to start really soon. You know, you're worried about so many different things, getting a good start, not making a mistake. You know, is my pit stop's going to be good? Is the crew ready? So uh, you just start thinking about every little thing right before this race, but when the, the lights go out, you put all that behind you. Yep, that's the time you compartmentalize, don't you? And it, it, it all comes into that focus uh, to get after it and uh, and get the job done here. And, uh, you know, we were just seeing there, we saw all of these riders looking really serious. But then, and you're talking about the butterflies and everything, and then you have a shot of Danny Esla, who's won it four times, grinning, laughing, talking, and joking. He understands he's been here before. That doesn't mean he's, uh, he's nowhere near as focused as anybody else. He's there. Uh, he just has been here before. He's been there, done that. He's been there and done that, and I think for some guys, they uh, they like to get locked in and stay really focused, and some guys like to keep it loose because mm -hmm. they get too they put too much pressure too on themselves, wound up. Yeah. get too nervous. So uh, Danny's got a lot of experience, especially here at Daytona. He's won it four times, so I think he knows exactly how to play this race. And a good look there at Hayden Gillum, who is just proving to be uh, just a really really steady rider, really quick and. Uh, I, I've got a feeling about him. I think he's going to put in a really good ride. He's got a good chance. He's been really fast this week and uh, doing the bagger race as well. So there's a lot of guys. We we'll talk about how deep this field is that have a chance. They do indeed. With that, it's time to get us back over to the MAP TV booth with Greg and Jason. Welcome back to Daytona International Speedway as the Daytona 200 is just about seven and a half minutes away from getting going, which means we have an opportunity to bring in the third member of our broadcast team, Hannah Lopa, who's down on the grid with our pole sitter, Josh Heron. Hey, Hannah. It is a beautiful day for some racing out here, Greg White. I'm with Josh Heron. Three championship titles to his name, but for the first time ever, we'll be running that number one plate, starting from pole position, no less. Josh, how has this super sport season and the championship prepared you for the task at hand today? Oh, it's nice. I mean, we got uh, this is now the third time that we've been at Daytona with this bike. So it's the only track that we've been to more than once. So it's been good to just get some information from it. Also having Chavi here, this is the first time I've had another guy on the same bike that we can relay some information, set it up. So we've been able to make some improvements to it that I think helped out a lot. But uh, yeah, to get one last hurrah on the V2 is, is pretty awesome. We're moving up to the V4 for Superbike this year. So I'm just ready to go out, have some fun. We're, uh, we're all calm down here, having a good time. and. And uh, I'm just ready to get things going. It's a longer, uh, longer pre-gear than normal, so it's a little strange for us. But I'm ready to have some fun and, and uh, try to get this V2 up top. Well, it certainly would be the cherry on top for Josh Heron as he moves up to Superbike. Walking down the grid here past Tyler Scott, making his debut at the 200, only 17 years old. Starting from the front row, but I want to check in with his teammate, Richie Escalante. Richie, you made your Daytona 200 debut last season. Now, again with the same team, but on the 750. What are some of the noticeable differences between these two machines? Yeah, so this year is completely different. Uh, my team, Vision William Forrester Suzuki by Mission Food. Uh, working amazing to prepare this race. Uh, I have uh, two day testing before this race, and also during the weekend, I feel amazing. So. All my team is ready, I'm ready, and yeah, I have uh, the experience behind me for from last year, so yeah, the plan is uh, try to enjoy the race, this long race, and 
I'm super happy. I'm uh, real uh, happy to represent the Latin Americans. So thank you and gracias a todos. Best of luck out there to Richie Escalante. Definitely in good spirits as we make our way further back on the grid. One more rider I want to check in with passing by Josh Hayes here going for that all time wind record. But no grid walk would be complete without talking to our defending Daytona 200 champion Brandon Posh as he's putting on his gloves here. Brandon, what is it going to take for you to do the three peat? Uh, the three peat would be uh, undeniable. Nobody can, uh, can have anything to say after that. So we'll give it a good go here. Just uh, stay calm and patient and uh, see how the race plays out. There's a lot of good riders this year again, like there was the past two years. So I don't know. It's 200. Anything can happen. And uh, just try and keep our head down and keep going to the front. So. Best of luck out there, Brandon. Anything can happen indeed, Greg. Yeah, it's a 200. It's a long race. And let's take a look, Jason, at Daytona International Speedway because this racetrack is not the most complex racetrack we have on the circuit, but it's demanding. It is demanding. It's demanding on, on machine more than anything. It's not a real physical track. And uh, you can see there's going to be a lot of drafting here, Greg, down into turn one. little unique area that we start here. We start actually on pit lane as we go down into turn one. That uh, International Horseshoe famous place will be interesting that first lap through. That fast kink in the infield. We'll talk more about that one as the, as the race goes on. Get back on the banking there in turn six, all the way around that east banking, Greg, down into the chicane, and then back to the west bank, and that takes you all the way to the tri-oval. And, you know, at the beginning of this race, we're going to see uh, probably 15 riders in that lead draft. So it's here, Brandon, just say, just got to try to get to the front, but also keep your nose clean. Lap number one into the chicane is going to be very interesting. This guy trying to make history. We are three and a half minutes away from a race start. It's the 2023 Daytona 200. Come back. One of the things that's interesting to me is you have these these long setups for these major races of, of whatever type it is, these long pre-race festivities. Yeah, they have the umbrellas out there, but the riders get out there. They're amped. They know what, you know, it's the 200, and then they sit, and then they sit. And, yeah, they're getting interviewed, and people are, are swinging by, but it, it's got to be a little bit distracting for them to be able to just get zoned in a little bit here it's before just, the starts. It's a longer time to, to the nerves really set in when you're on the grid. Yeah. You know, you're a little bit nervous before the race, but once you get on the grid and it's just you, the team, and you're, you're kind of focused and that's when ever you get really nervous and, you know, they get a long time to think about it, a lot longer than normal. So for a lot of guys, and then also it's warm. Yeah. Hydration and, and all that as well comes into play. So uh, a lot of these guys have a long time to think about it. Uh, you could tell the interviews were getting a little bit shorter as we were getting closer to uh, race time. The, the riders getting a little more focused. So um, we're not too far away. You know that, though, right? When you decide I'm going to go pro and then you end up racing in one of the absolute elite races in the in the world, really, you know that you're going to be a little bit more eyeball on you, a little bit more under the microscope, a lot more requested of your time, but you understand that. Yeah, you go into it, and then you just know, for one, you, you want that time to, to thank your sponsors and all that and get your face out there. But now, this close to the race, that's all anybody's thinking about. All right, bikes are heading out on their installation lap, and that means it's time for us to turn it back over to the MAV booth and G-Dub and JP. The Daytona 200 is brought to you by Bridgestone Tire, Bridgestone Solutions for your journey, and by Pirelli Tire. Pirelli, power is nothing without control. Welcome back to Daytona Beach, Florida and the World Center of Racing as we are taking a look at the starting grid for the Daytona 200. It's Josh Aaron on pole, BJ Jacobson, and Ty Scott. Then we got Danny Eslick, Richie Escalante, and Hayden Gillum there in row two. Back to row three, Cam Peterson, Josh Hayes, Jeff May, Posh, Teague Hobbs doing a great job in his debut with that team. And then a little further back, row five, Max Angle, Chobby Flores, Blake Davis, Ben Young from Canada, Carl Soltis, and Taylor Knapp. Ben Young, Superbike champion up there last year. Riser Irwin, Jason Waters, David Anthony, Miranda, Jagalov, and Alex Arango. Back to row nine, Greg, Camille Holland, Danilo Lewis, Darren James, Coelho, Vincent Lavellian, 
and Jason Farrell. And as we get through this back bridge, yeah, I think it's really important to, to take a look at those first couple rows. We expect to have one group, and the Daytona 200 is really infamous for just clumps of riders getting together and racing. I can see the first five rows, to be honest with you. When you look at that, Blake Davis uh, is going to be starting outside row five. Everybody from that forward 15 people there, I think, are going to be the ones that, that you know, that's where the, the winner is going to come from. Uh, you know, this great, we talk about it every year here that, that it takes a little luck to win this race um, because there's so many other facets of this, the, this race that come into play, you know, with the pit stops and things. And just getting off to a good, clean start, getting those first sort of like four or five laps under your belt and, and finding that clean spot where you can ride. A lot of these guys have raced against each other. You look at somebody like Josh Heron, I, I think he's going to be a difficult one to beat this year. I think that that team's learned a lot. He's the defending champion of that class last year. He's got time on this motorcycle. Um, and so there's there are people, uh, Escalante, you know, that you look at what the, the Vision Will M4 X-Star Suzuki team has done, um, getting their GSX-R 750s better prepped, better prepared. They've, they've come into this race. They look so much stronger, so much better. Chris Ulrich has done a tremendous job with that team. They've got two young guys in Teague Hobbs and Ty Scott, who's, you know, Ty starting on the front row. It really is anybody's race. And this, obviously, we talk about a race that can be won and lost in the pits, but also it's on the riders after those pit stops to have a critical outlap and make sure they go as fast as possible. And that is based on a lot of experience for a lot of riders. The fact that they've been through this before and no one more experienced than that number four in the middle part of your screen. The Squid Hunter racing on the Yamaha R6. That's Josh Hayes going for an all-time record, looking at 87 professional super sport wins in his career. I love this guy, too, Hayden Gillum. I mean, there's another guy, Greg, who's been riding a lot of different motorcycles, but he's been fast here all weekend long, and he'll be the guy that'll be in that lead draft, too. So we'll uh, looking forward to this. They're getting ready to go. When the lights go off, we're going. It's a 2023 Daytona 200, and race action has gotten underway, and it looks like the number one plate of Josh Heron gets a good launch. And he's going to lead us through turn one. Now it's a matter of keeping your nose clean and trying to get through these corners. You can see riders trying to find position in the back part, but here goes Heron. Yeah, he's doing a good job. Just gets a, This is where you just got to stay clean, like you say. Things can get bottlenecked up here as they go into the International Horseshoe. Everybody looks like they're going to get through that okay. And then you're going to go into this really fast kink. First lap out, you see Heron with Eslick right behind him. P.J. Jacobson is is also, you can see him in the yellow, just to the outside now of, of Eslick. He goes around the outside of him there, and I believe it's Escalante or Ty Scott there in fourth. Brandon Posh buried back there. Looks like he's about... Uh, Ninth or tenth place at the moment, trying to go for that three-peat. But it's four-time Daytona 200 champion Danny Eslick in third on that TOBC Racing Triumph. Up onto the banking they go for the first time. P.J. Jacobson looks like he's going to pull out of the draft. He had a notion to take over the lead, but Heron on his V2 Ducati doing a great job of fending him off as they head towards the first time into the chicane. And P.J., like you heard him say, he's been running around by himself all weekend long. Some of these guys have teammates. P.J., uh, does in true love, but he's been by himself all weekend long. I ran into his dad this morning grabbing a coffee, and he was talking to me about just that, that he's been just kind of doing times by himself, seeing how things go. And uh, so, you know, he's going to be experiencing that draft. And look how quick he was through the chicane on that first lap. Now you're going to see these other four bikes behind him draw up to the back of P.J. Jacobson as they come down towards the tri-oval for that first lap. It's always fun to lead the first lap here of the 200, but the most important one's that 57th one. Cameron Peterson on the attack bike down part of your screen. As you can see, two riders just blow by P.J. Jacobson on that Celtic Titler Cycle TSE racing Yamaha R6. So there's no need to panic in these early laps, is there, JP? No. Just because you're a couple bike lengths behind is not going to define your 57 laps. And that's the worst part. We have a bike smoking in the background. I saw there, Greg. But you're, to your point, you know, you saw that first five riders had kind of gotten away just a little bit. And uh, Hayes and Gillum now have pulled up to the back end of them with Posh just behind him. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is even if you're running sort of 10th right now, if you're back where Carl Soltis is, is a great start for him, by the way, on the number 60, there's no reason to really panic yet. You're going to get pulled around this banking. You can be some two seconds off the fastest pace at Daytona, and you can kind of get in these lead drafts. As you Ooh, see, Cam Peterson be. has a big one out of the second horseshoe there. He'll pull it back down and get himself sorted. And uh, P.J. Jacobson just behind him in fourth. But, and, and, you know, Danny Eslick right now, when he came across the line, he was almost sitting up behind Heron in the draft. Uh, so, you know, he was getting pulled all the way from that chicane. 
Josh Heron on the Warhorse HSBK Racing Ducati New York machine. And you can see that even Heron got a little sideways before we saw Cam P. Of course, this is the one time all season we'll see Cameron Peterson on Pirelli brand of tires that are, of course, supporting the attack racing team. So Danny Eslick to the point. There goes the TOBC racer, mm. and he'll take the shot. Josh Heron, of course, coming in. Jason, I talked to him after his Super Sport Championship. He got the nod that he was going to be on the Super Bike for the remainder of the season. And Josh set sail to lose some weight, get more fit. And he looks trim. I mean, he's dropped over 20 pounds since the end of last season, trying to keep some muscle mass to muscle around a Medallia Superbike later this year. But it's all about this one. There's B.J. Jacobson going around the outside. He'll take over the spot for the moment. Yeah, and this, down it to turn one they go. And this is what you're going to see, you know, for the first 20-something laps. It's, expect the pit windows, Greg, to kind of be between laps 18 to 20, 21, 22 laps, somewhere in there. Everyone will have a little bit different strategies. Some of the bikes, some of the teams with two or three riders, got to make sure that their guys aren't coming in maybe at the exact same time. So, you know, it's important right now for these guys to just kind of see what's going on here. It looks like uh, Camp Peterson has got his arm up and... It didn't look like he was happy about something. No, so keep an eye on keep an eye on Cam. Cameron Peterson, the 45 on the blue machine with those bright yellow numbers. He's starting to to go backwards. Yeah, so something's going, on. something's going on with him. It could be the possibility that Cameron Peterson pulls into the pit. There's Josh Hayes, number four. The screen. So all eyes on the attack performance. Yamaha R6 of Cameron Peterson, who was on a revenge tour after losing by seven thousandths of a second last year. He started to drift backward. Bike's still running, though, which is a good sign. But as we wait to see what happens with Cameron Peterson, out front is PJ G Jacobson. Hanalopa, what do you have on the 66? Greg, the last time that PJ raced here was in 2011, and he's never gone the full 200 miles. So really the main goal for the start of the weekend was trying to re-familiarize himself with the track and the little nuances of this. They went to Roebling to shake down the bike, get used to the 600 again. It feels very different than the super bike that he was used to riding all last season. But he's got a lot of experience in endur endurance racing. Did the Suzuka eight hour in world endurance, so he's no stranger to these pit stops coming up here in just a little bit. Yeah, and Hannah's referring to Roebling Road Raceway, which a lot of teams went to and tested at the beginning of last week. And he's got a great crew in the TSE crew down there that are going to be helping support those pits, uh, pit stops for him. They are a team that obviously has won the Daytona 200 before. But, you know, Greg, you could see when he came off that back banking how big of a lead P.J. Jacobson had. And uh, it just doesn't take much for these guys to all draw up to the back. He's going to find himself third now as he goes down towards that international horseshoe. And this is, uh, you know, Hayden Gillums right there with Josh Hayes and uh, Richie Escalante. So uh, right now, when you start to look at it, Richie Escalante goes around at 49.5. So our lead group, our lead seven guys are in the 49s. Camp Peterson did continue to go around. So uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that again to see kind of what was happening there. Could be a case where Cam has just decided, OK, it's a little racy at the front. Uh, you know, maybe I'm just going to kind of hang at the back. You saw Brandon Powell do that last year so nicely. So, but, uh, you know, a little bit worrisome right now for Peterson. As you can see, he's just losing a little bit of ground. We've got a yellow flag out in turn five. So yellow flag flying means that there's an incident. And it looks like, is it Chavi Forez? It is. Oh, unfortunately for the Spaniard, Chavi Forez on the Warhorse HSBK Racing Ducati New York machine, he's got to park that V2. So his race could possibly be over as he doesn't look like he's going to be able to get it back. And that is a shame because... He certainly talked to me about how iconic Daytona 200 is for European racers, and he really wanted to have a good result here. Yeah, over in Europe right now, there's so many riders that talk about this race and would love to get back over here at some point, whether it's in the middle of their careers or at the end of them, just to try to get on these high banks of Daytona. But, you know, the, the worst part about this, Greg, we saw a bike smoking earlier, if you remember. Um, the worst part about this now is he's got a teammate in Josh Heron, and you got to think that the bike builds are very, very similar, very, very uh, alike. So... You know, this is this now is going to be something where we're going to have to keep an eye on Heron a little bit closer and uh, make sure that we don't see any smoke coming from that bike either. Another pass for the lead. Danny Eslick goes to the point around Josh Heron. P.J. underneath goes 
the mission Vision Wheel M4X star Suzuki of Richie Escalante, who we got to talk to earlier. That's the number 54, third bike on your screen. There's Josh Hayes, the number four, who if you remember last year on the same bike, the Squid Hunter Racing Yamaha R6 had to come from back of the grid, and we saw him in the same position within four or five laps. He was right in this lead pack. Cameron Peterson, Jay, just saw back there. He's at the back of this group. He had another look over his shoulder. I think there's an issue that he's trying to diagnose on board. It very well could be, Greg, but I think also he realizes that this group in front of him is not going anywhere. There's no reason to stress yourself out or the bike or do anything like that. You want to just try to find a comfortable spot to get into. None of these guys are going to be able to run away from each other. So, you know, this is, again, where these in-laps are going to come into play uh, that is so important. Additionally, Cameron Peterson recently had arm pump surgery, arm pump. Yeah. right? And so there might be an instance where, I mean, this isn't the most physically demanding track, but also... He might be just playing it, so he's trying to give himself a rest. I mean, again, just speculation on our part as we have another pass for the lead. If you're just joining us, this is the 81st running of the Daytona 200. And Danny Eslick, number 69 on the TOBC Racing. That's a triumph. 765 triple. So we are our second season, our second year into the next generation motorcycles. You have a Ducati V2 in second spot with Josh Heron as the pilot. That's a 955, you have a triple 765. You have a 750cc inline four cylinder in Richie Escalante's GSXR 750. You have a 600cc inline four cylinder of Josh Hayes and PJ Jacobson. There are bikes of all different manufacturers, all different displacement sizes, all controlled to create an equal playing field. And that's what you're seeing on the high banks of Daytona. Yeah, and let's give a shout out to Teague Hobbs, doing a really nice job in ninth place right now. You can see him just come into the shot in the background. He's running right around the same lap times. In fact, that time through 50.3, but he's gone 49, and he's got this big group right here. There you go. There's Teague Hobbs, first race on this GSXR 750, doing a really good job right now of keeping these lead eight riders, and he's got Ty Scott behind him at the moment. If those two guys can kind of get together somehow and pull each other along, that's going to be helpful. But Teague slowly but surely closing that gap down to those. So I'm very impressed by the 79 right now uh, in his what would be his first Daytona 200, I believe. Jason, when I spoke to Teague, he said he actually has quite a lot of laps here over his young career, lives just down the road. They did run this race in 21 as a privateer. It was a family effort. He got six. So this year, he's really hoping to crack that top five. Yeah, thanks, Hannah, for that, because I wasn't sure if he had actually done this race before. But, you know, at the level and the team that he has now, this is a whole other experience for him. And uh, he's probably going to get a little excited seeing himself start to reel these guys back in. And he just has to keep a cool head about him like we know he can and, uh, and try to keep chipping away at this. So Danny Eslick into the chicane on lap number six of 57. Nice little wheelie out. That Triumph turns in the middle of that it, chicane, it, doesn't it? It really does. Yeah. Like, like there's a bump on in the transition when you're going from through the middle of the chicane, and Danny's able to turn it on the inside. It's looking yeah. pretty good. So here goes Heron down to the bottom of the banking. Doesn't really even need the draft and pass too much. The biggest news is not just the temperature, but also the fact that there is not much wind blowing. The wind has picked up during the course of the day. As now we go off into turn number one and another lead change. And there's Josh Hayes falling victim to PJ Jacobson. So it's Yamaha R6. Those two are duking it out. Cam Peterson also on the Yamaha R6 still there. PJ looking for some real estate. He always just kind of, it's funny, he shoots out to the outside going through the chicane and he even does it. I noticed earlier in the race as he goes through this kink, he'll fire himself over off to the left-hand side of the track as they go into this next horseshoe. Look for the bike and fit there. He kind of will fire himself out to the outside. You saw him go around the outside of Eslick early in the race. But, you know, PJ probably put his head down for that one time through the infield, pulled that big gap, realized he couldn't kind of get away. So it's kind of what you do, Greg. Every now and then you want to take a shot and see if you can get away from break that field. And he kind of wasn't able to do it and realizes he's just kind of got to wait out his time, bide his time, be patient, and go from there. Danny Eslick and Heron are the two guys that have just continually stayed at the front. As our lead group on the high banks at Daytona, we're going to step away. When we come back, we're going to have more race action coming at you from the World Center of Racing with 50 laps to go. Furious battling up in this front group, and 
Uh, having a look here, just looking at some of the most recent times, you know, fast lap of the race thus far was set by Richie Escalani, a 149.562. On the last lap that was just done, Teague Hobb turned a 149.6. So he is definitely reeling these guys in. But Roger, right now we have a break, seven guys out front, and then you got Cameron Teague and Tyler Scott back, out back there trying to gain up. Yeah, this has been an incredible ride by Teague Hobbs. He's caught these guys by himself, and now he's on the group. So great ride by him. Uh, he's a little bit back there, but I think if he can keep doing what he's doing, he'll be on them before the first stop. Yeah, and obviously we're seeing this lead group. It's pretty much what we expected. Nobody really trying to make a breakaway. And as you said, Roger, it is going to be one of those races that just runs and runs and runs. Brandon Pash, the defending champion in sixth. Great racing. More to come here at Daytona. Welcome back to the Daytona 200. 49 and a half laps remain in the race in our first stint. Uh, Jason, we talk about these stints because it's before the first pit stop. We expect the first pit stop window to open somewhere around lap 16 or 17. A lot of teams talking about coming in on lap number 19. And then the second stint, they'll try to extend it to 20. What do you see, Jay? Yeah, just during our commercial break, I was looking at our window and I saw Cam Peterson go down the outside of Teague Hobbs going down to turn one. And I thought I saw some corner workers running there, Greg, and I, and I don't see him back there uh, behind Teague Hobbs now. So maybe he ran straight or ran off. Here you go. I was looking out the window. I could see him go to the outside. And uh, I saw a bunch of corner workers running. So he's just going to get in there a little bit too deep. Sometimes, Greg, you get in there, you catch a false neutral. And that might be what's going on with him. He may have just caught himself a false neutral and, and ran wide. But, yeah, there's something something happening with Cam Peterson. So you're right. He was trying to diagnose a problem while he was staying in that lead group. Teague Hobbs had caught him. They were on the tail end of this group. And, uh, and yeah, big problems for Cam. Possibility earlier on in the weekend on Thursday when they were here, Cameron Peterson said that they weren't at the top of the timesheets because they were having some shifting issues. So that okay. might be part of the problem. But up front, in this lead group, you have the 69 of Danny Essick. Number one is Josh Aaron as he takes over the spot. 66 is P.J. Jacobson. 54 is Richie Escalante. And it looks like Brandon Posh has joined our group and starting to move up. So oh, Posh is really wide, yeah, Craig. He's really wide. Excuse me. Yeah, no problem. So Heron, he'll rejoin. I don't think that's too much drama. So it looks like, is that Josh Hayes in the lead? He Just is. like that? Just like that. And he's going to do what Josh does. He likes to, Josh loves to lead races. He loves to just get out in front and try to wear people out. Uh, you know, talking with him all during the off season, coming back from this broken ankle. Uh, he's been he's been working really hard on trying to get his fitness up as much as he can. I mean, Greg, he was still on a walking boot and getting on his bicycle and going out and trying to do some just mellow rides, trying to get himself back into the shape that he needed to be in to come here. And this is what he'll do. He'll try to get out front and stretch this pace through the infield and try to pull that gap. And T. Hobbs is right back on the back of these guys. So he's showing me right now he's got a lot of pace too, this young man, as we talked about earlier. But Hayes pulled that gap. He's got Escalante behind him, chasing him down. And then it looks like we've probably got uh, Danny Eslick there. And Posh just biding his time there in fifth place. Escalante's draft, and so you can see, Greg, you can try to pull away from people, and it's just it's just too hard. And talking with Hayes a little bit earlier, I know he talked to us a little bit about that pace, and not sure if he's got quite the pace to, to, to pull out of that draft at the line. So we'll see how that plays out for the, for the four. And the pace you're talking about is really just the pace on the banking for Hayes. Well, of course, if you're an aficionado of the Daytona 200, you know that Josh Hayes in 2008 came across start-finish line first, and unfortunately was disqualified. And that means the win went to Chaz Davis. And Chaz Davis is the last of our non-American winners. And that was all the way back in 2008. So Richie Escalante, if he can pull off this big victory, would be the first non-American to win the Daytona 200 since 2008. And right now, the mission, Vision Wheel M4X star Suzuki rider, Richie Escalante leads us with 48 laps to go in this race. Hayes looking for a way around, but Jay, just up ahead, I saw the first glimpses of lap traffic. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we talked about a lot last year. There were times in this race, Greg, where you'd get into back markers on sort of the third lap of the race, and Moto America's done a nice job of yeah, kind of closing the field down a little bit. We're on lap 11 now, and both these guys do a tremendous job of getting out of the way. They know there's going to be a freight train of bikes coming through, and uh, it's a horrible place to be in if you're them because... You know, there's going to be six, seven, eight riders that are trying to get through as quickly as they can. 
and uh, you can get caught out a little bit there but that's all a part of this race and getting that luck of being able to catch guys at the right places right times and you can see it's separated this field just a little bit escalante to the front and Jason, after last year, he feels much more prepared heading into this year, despite an entire season on the Superbike. He said he started training specifically for this long race. December 1st, had a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and then back to work January 1st. Lost about 10 pounds so that he could feel light enough and small enough to tuck in on these high banks. This is his first experience with the 750. He said it, the power delivery has a similar feel to the Superbike, and it really writes really suits his riding style he said he is a super sport guy at heart he's very comfortable he understands this track and his strategies after his experience last year and then you add the relationship with the team into it oh it looks like we have a rider down guys yeah it looks like the 474 has gone down trying to get a number uh, a name on that for you for greg and uh oh, 474 is camille holen out of the czech republic all on right. the Blue Garage Racing by Boulder Motorsports. That's right. a Pentagali V2. Lose that front end there. Yeah. Just going into that second horseshoe. But Maybe a little offline as well. Glad to see Glad to see he's okay. So getting back to what Hannah said, you know, it's funny because Escalante jumped from Super Sport up to Superbike, and it's a little bit of a different game when you're there and you, you, you know, thousands are, are require a little bit different riding styles and things. We've seen Richie obviously very, very successful in Super Sport over the years, winning races, winning championship there. And, and so on. So the fact that he went into a, uh, a, a mode of trying to lose some pounds as he loses the front. Wow. Wow. That was, you know, catching again, catching up to back marker. Had nothing to do with that rider in front of him. He just kind of lost the front going in there, was able to get it going. I did notice the other day when I was out watching, Greg, just how bumpy it looks like the infield's got. It's got a little bit bumpier in some spots. And uh, so for these guys, if they get a little bit offline or they got to go past somebody that might be in a spot they haven't been all weekend long, and uh, and they might they might find a few bumps out there. Didn't take him long to recover, though, as he's going to go back past Josh Hayes as they head down that back straightaway. Yeah, Hayes looked like a sitting duck out there compared to that GSXR 750 of Escalante. So the group has kind of settled itself down into, it looks like eight riders. If you're just joining us, the left part of your screen doing the wheelie is Richie Escalante. That's our leader. He's up on lap traffic. Some of the riders that you see higher up there. So it's Escalante who leads on the Suzuki GSXR 750. That's a Mission Vision Wheel M4X Star Suzuki. Squid Hunter Racing. Josh Hayes, number four. Trying to get his first Daytona 200 win. But Jay, it's kind of, it's way, it's so early talking about it. It's really going to see what happens in the pits. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you know, I'm just looking to see, Greg, who's kind of getting dropped back there through this bit of traffic that we've had. It looks like we've got about the first five, six guys. I see PJ there. And it looks like Brandon Posh and Teague Hobbs lost out just a little bit there. And, you know, when you're when you're going through the infield, you want to be the first guy up to these to the to some of the tail enders. You want to be the first guy by them and uh, and hope that you can get past them clean enough and and get some other people. And Greg, I'm looking up out our pot box right now. I see Cam Peterson rolling down pit lane as Josh Hayes is trying to go up the inside of Escalante in that second horseshoe. He's going to make that pass. You know, Hayes understands that, you know, when you start seeing some of the, the traffic ahead, it's really key to be the first guy by them. So he takes it back to the front. And there's Camp Peterson. They're putting fuel on the bike and, and doing what would look like a normal pit stop. And you can see he's, the gesturing there, Greg, kind of looks like downshift stuff, right? Like it's not quite it was maybe he, not going into gear. It was either that or chatter. Like that would, but that, that's he, not quite chatter. Yeah, that was, yeah. That was more like he was looking down at the shifter and kind of gesturing that, that it could be something to do with that. Second bike in your screen is Escalante. The 370, 270, sorry, is lap traffic. Kind of a bad place to be caught in lap uh. traffic. Blue flags do fly for the lap traffic, though, indicating that the lead group is coming around. But the person who took the biggest advantage of it, at least for the moment, looks like the 69 of Eslick. All the while, dude, Posh again, JP, just hanging back there. That's what he does. After Heron, he hasn't quite recovered to the front since he ran wide in turn one a couple laps ago. But again, this is the Daytona 200, no drama, as Heron just drives right past four bikes and he'll take over that spot. 179 miles an hour, 181 for Hayden Gillum back there. Probably the biggest rider in the group. So the Disrupt Racing rider Hayden Gillum last time by the stripe, 181 miles an hour. That is on 
a middleweight displacement motorcycle. Incredible and, speed. And I'm loving seeing Hayden Gillum just play the patient game right now. Again, he's already gone through it, and he's probably thought, okay, everybody in front of me has led this race. Every single person. Posh looks back. Teague Hobbs lost out big time somewhere, Greg, uh, in that running past to the back markers. He was some three seconds slower than Posh in front of him that lap. So somewhere along the line there, he got lost in traffic. And uh, but, but but Hayden Gillum literally just kind of hanging out with Posh in the back of this group. And Jason Hayden Gillum getting a lot of laps here this weekend between the two classes. He's also running Mission King of the Baggers that he will have at the conclusion of this race. As far as it goes with the Disrupt team, he's got a really close relationship with them. They, they've worked together a lot. The communication is really efficient, and he's got a lot of trust in them. So the going back and forth between his bagger and the super sport bike has really not made that big of a difference for him. He's able to easily switch gears. He's a very versatile rider, ridden a lot of different things throughout the years. So keep an eye out. Yeah, there's no question, Hannah. He is versatile, and there's a good look at him right there on that fluorescent orange bike in the background. Disrupt Racing making a, a really big footprint in the Moto America paddock now, Greg. I think that they've got a rider that they really trust and believe in, and, and uh, you know we're going to continue to see him get results this year. Um, he's going to be a player in some, motor, in some super bike things as well. And Hayden Gillum has so much riding ahead of him this year. Going to be competing in Stock 1000 in, in Medallia Superbike and Mission King of the Baggers. And in some of those weekends, he's going to be all those races in one weekend. How would you like to have to race a bagger after doing a 200 mile race at the yeah, title? I don't know. Good luck, Ken. <laughs> Good luck. It's probably going to it's probably going to be easier. Easier maybe, for him. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. So, Jay, we're coming up here on lap number 14. This is when teams start talking about that pit window opening up. There's probably some activity at Hannah seeing on pit lane where teams are starting to prepare. Moving tires into place, maybe getting some of those pneumatic tools into, into place. We expect to see quite a few of these riders come in around lap 18, 19. We don't think anybody's really going to push past 20 as Josh Heron on the number one bike and the Warhorse HSBK Racing Ducati New York entry goes to the top for the moment with PJ Jacobson right behind him on the 66 on the Celtic Titler Cycles TSC Racing Yamaha R6. Of course, PJ Jacobson, full-time in Medallia Superbike class for Moto America this season. And it looks like Tyler Scott's gonna be coming in is on he, the is Vision he coming in? He's Ford. in. He's, He's in. actually in, Greg, yeah. So they're getting a tire, and I'm trying to figure out, it doesn't look like a guy who's ready to go jump back on a bike. I'm, I'm very curious to know, G-Dub, why he was so far back. This guy qualified second, and we know he's got pace, but he's not really been close so far in the first half of this race, and they're going to go ahead and they're going to look at this thing a little bit closer. Anna? Tyler is talking to his team. The bike is refueled, fresh tires changed, ready to go. Tyler's still sitting on the wall, so he's communicating with the team, but it looks like they're pushing the bike off of the pit lane. Not quite sure what's going on. I'll get some uh, more insight and fill you guys in. Keep an eye out too, Hannah, for Teague Hobbs, because I'm very curious. He was running 49s and 50s very consistently, and now we have he's, he's doing 52s. I know he's pushing his own win back there by himself now, but uh, you know I'm hoping that this isn't again a problem that we're going to uh, uh, see for him as well. As you see, our lead group rolls off down into turn one there. Escalante up the inside of P.J. Jacobson, but you know uh, th th these guys are all starting to think about this this pit stops that are coming up. We're going to step away from the Daytona 200. When we come back, pit stops are going to be fast and furious. You don't want to go anywhere. I'll tell you, this group up front, they are absolutely fast and furious. Josh Heron had that little mistake over in the International Horseshoe, went way wide, came right back, and has aggressively fought his way to the front. Uh, obviously wants to run at the front, but one of the big stories here, obviously, is Cam Peterson. Second last year, so close, and struggling. Yeah, he's been into the pits with a pit stop. Uh, we were talking about that uh, before we came on air, but uh, Roger, back markers now also starting to play a huge part. We saw Brandon Pash lose out earlier on. He came back in the group, and that there was, uh, well, could have been a disaster for Josh Herod and those leading group. Yeah, you can see the leaders, they're trying to get by there aggressively as possible to see maybe if they can get a lap or in between them and a couple of the other guys and see if they can, you know, break that draft if possible, but I think it's going to be difficult. Lappers are going to be part of this race. And of course, Tyler Scott in the pits as well. Stories continuing back to the Mav booth. Welcome back to Daytona International Speedway. 
We're in the middle of the Daytona 200. We haven't had a pit stop yet, Jason Pridmore, but we're getting close to that first pit stop, something that could really define, really ruin someone's race if the team isn't able to get that bike in and out as quickly as possible. The lead group up front remains the same. It's Richie Escalante who leads Josh Heron. Josh Heron has had the fastest lap of the race back on lap 10, a 149 flat. Currently, this lead group circulating in the 150 mid-range as P.J. Jacobson goes to the top of the pile with the 69 of Danny Eslick, who's won this race four times right there as well. Josh Hayes still in the mix. And Hayden Gillum, just off the back, though, is two-time in a row winner, Brandon Posh. Yeah, and he's just going to camp out there. As you can see, this is that big draft as they come down to the line. It gets tight when it gets down to the bottom here when you get on the apron, and he's going to just get his nose in there so that Escalante can respond and move up the bank just a little. You can see that's going to move PJ up the banking. It's amazing, you know, Greg, when you're out there, you can actually feel people drafting you when you're tucked in, and it feels like you're getting sucked backwards, you know, and uh, that's probably something that Escalante felt. You can feel the, uh, the, the air around you disrupting the motorcycle uh, and it, it makes the bike move around a lot so with the aerodynamics of these bikes now over the years they've just gotten so much better but they're still if you're out where PJ is right now you're pushing that air and everybody else is going to get a big uh, a, a draft from that well it looks like Ty Scott has been out of the race Hannah what do you know about what's going on with Ty Scott Greg, we did see him pull in, and while the team was prepared to change tires and refuel the motorcycle, it was actually electronic issues that caused him to re-enter the pit lane. The data engineer is reviewing things. He did take off his helmet and gloves. Not quite sure if he's looking to get back out there. I'll keep you posted. P.J. Jacobson had quite the lead, and Jay, this might be an indicator, too, with P.J. is trying to put that hammer down and get some distance to come in for a pit stop. We'll keep an eye on that. We've seen riders do that in the past. So Jacobson leads from Eslick, Escalante, and on the high banks, here comes Josh Heron with not a lot of room, real close to that wall, but still able to get by and moves himself into third spot. So it looks like everybody in this lead group going for another lap. And credited with the lead for that lap will go Richie Escalante on the 54. But Heron goes up the inside into turn number one. And I'm going to tell you, there's some bumps out there. As Heron goes a little wide, Escalante forcing the issue. But the Ducati looks really stable over the bumps. Yeah, it does. And, you know, this is what we saw last year from Heron. And then they actually just ended up Escalante. Essex stuffs it up underneath Escalante, gives him a little wave of sorry there. These guys all know that they're not trying to carve each other up in the infield parts of this track. So, uh, but Heron, if we remember, Greg, I think he ran about, what, half a lap too long last year and ran out of fuel as he was coming out of the chicane. I remember seeing him along the apron trying to get that bike back to the pits. And uh, we're in that window, kind of getting in that window, aren't we? We're on lap 17. You're going to start seeing it between 18 and 21 laps is where I feel all of these riders are going to start to pit. So what we'll do is we'll keep an eye when they come out of the chicane, you'll start to see riders signal to the riders around them, behind them with either a leg or an arm, something that lets these guys know, hey, we're getting ready to pull in. And it will also be interesting to see how many of these guys are on the same strategies. Going down the banking is Escalante. 19 liters of fuel, the maximum allowed in the Daytona 200. So that's what they have to play with. Additionally, once they hit the line entering pit lane, they have to get the bike slowed down to 60 kilometers per hour. Most of these bikes are equipped with pit lane speed limiters. Heron, not the smoothest I've seen coming out of the chicane, and that's caused a little bit of a gap to Escalante. Escalante's down low. This could be something where you might see the 54 duck into pit lane. It looks like he is. he's going to stay low, Greg. Nope, he's staying. Yes, he is. He's coming down pit lane, Greg. So. There's one of the first ones of our leaders, the 54 is coming down pit lane. Now he's got to get that thing on the pit lane speed limiter and go all the way down to the end of pit lane. And this is something that you and I talked about earlier, the strategies of where you actually put yourself on pit lane. Yeah, it's important, I think, to a lot of people, especially last year when it was colder, to be as close to pit out as possible to keep the maximum amount of heat in your tires because the outlap is critical. So the left part of your screen is Richie Escalante and the pit stop. How quick is this going to happen? The right part of your screen is the lead, and you can see Heron's got his arm up, PJ's got his leg out there. And most of the time, Jason, we're waiting for fuel. And so now Escalante back on the bike on that mission, Vision Wheel M4X Star Suzuki, and he is going to be out of the pits as quickly as he possibly can. Now, this is where it comes into play. Now, you saw both Heron, PJ, they are both going to be able to 
the advantage that they are going to have if they come into the pits together, if their pits and their teams rather do great pit stops, they are going to be able to link back up when they come out of the pits to work together, Greg, and that's the key. Escalante came in a lap earlier than them. He's going to be out there by himself. So he's going to have to push himself as hard as he can on this out lap to make sure that when he gets route back around, that, that he's going to have the dance partner to go with. Last year, Escalante on the first pit stop had some problems, and he lost that toe, didn't he? And we saw him and I believe Max Engels running around together for most of that race a fair way back. So look for the 66 and the two to drop down the banking as they go up the banking now. Look for those guys to drop down and come into pit lane. And from our crack staff here that kept an eye on Escalante's pit stop, we have an estimated 14 seconds. So that's the benchmark currently. If you can beat that time in the pits, a lot of that time is waiting for the fuel to actually drop down to the bike. So here comes three riders into the pits. Hayden Gillum is that other rider from that Disrupt Racing team. And I'll tell you, Greg, this is the longest <laughs> this is the longest part of the race for them. You come from doing 180, 100, 170, 180 mile an hour down this, these, these bankings, and now you've got to slow the bike all the way down to crawling speed. Hayden Gillum's going to find his way to his pits quick first. Hanny, you're down in the pits. Tell us what you're seeing when these riders are coming in. The Ducati team is ready to receive Josh Heron as he is just trying to maintain the pit lane speed limit. Here he comes. They're ready waiting for him. That single-sided swing arm does make that rear tire change a little bit easier. Ryder is off the bike, but the most important thing is that fuel. Getting enough fuel in there and getting it done quickly. Almost done fueling. Rear tire is in. That front tire is back in. Josh is on the bike. Great pit stop from the Ducati Warhorse team. He's got to get it in gear and get going. You can see Hayden Gillum. So so in terms of pit stop to pit stop, Josh Heron got a little bit of an advantage on Hayden Gillum and a bit of an advantage on P.J. Jacobson. Jacobson looks to be within, well, distance of being able to catch the draft. But the question is, what happened to the 95 of Hayden Gillum and how's this going to affect his mid stint? Yeah, there's no question. These guys on the Warhorse team did a tremendous job getting the number one of Heron out. And this is there where I talked earlier in our stand up at the beginning, I said, these guys have been going out of pit lane. Here's True Love now with the TSC crew also coming in. He is currently inside, what is he, 11th, Greg, as he comes into the pits. They're going to get that rear axle in, get that stand down and get him on the way. Very experienced crew down there. You can see it. They're also down towards the end. But if you saw how quick Heron was getting out of pit lane, going around those cones at full lean angle already, the heat is already in the tires. The track is warm, so that's going to be a big advantage. Last year, when the track was cold, oh. being in a place where hey, uh, Hayden Gillum was before would have been a big disadvantage and uh, with, it, with it being warmer now, it's not so bad. Josh Hayes, Danny Essek now coming down pit lane as well. These two will also be able to link up together, and you can see Hayes looks over his shoulder. He can see that he's got somebody that came in with him, and that's going to be key. 17 seconds was the pit stop for Heron, 14 for Escalante that we've had a clock on. Here comes Josh Hayes to the Squid Hunter pit, and Hannah's down there. Again, Josh Hayes is pulling up to the team right now. They are ready to catch him. A lot of experience with pit stops. Last year, they changed the rules. You are able to refuel and do the tires at the same time. That certainly helps efficiency. Josh is getting a little hydration going. Seems pretty calm. Team is moving very quickly. Tires are on, fuel is good to go, and Josh is on his way. And, and this honestly couldn't have worked out any better for these two guys right now. They got each other to go out and, and ride with. Neither one of these guys, both with a ton of experience, are going to do anything to screw each other up, Greg, especially through the infields as we see it. So when we come across right now, Brandon Posh is still leading. He has not come in. Look for the three-time uh, champ to come in. The number 96 of Posh should be circulating somewhere out of the chicane right now. Here he comes, the last of our leading group riders. So it looked like Eslick was at 14 seconds as well. When this whole thing gets sorted out, after these last bit of pit stops, we're gonna see who's where. You can see on that timing pile on the left part of your screen where Josh Heron is. Some of these riders like Young, May, haven't been in yet. Taylor Knapp is another one. So we'll get all that. That'll sort itself out once riders get back out onto the banking and start crossing the timing loops. Well, we're going to be able to get a look at it as soon as Brandon comes down and he can see his legs out. He's coming into the pits. I'm looking out to see when Escalante comes across that finish line because right now he is out ahead of these guys. And uh, we're going to be able to see if Escalante with that fast pit stop from M4, huh? that's a good pit stop for them. Some three seconds quicker is Brandon Posh now coming to his team, coming to TOBC. See if they can run a good clean pit stop for him. 
Brandon Posh is in. They're putting the stand in. Front tire's coming off. Fuel nice and quick. Brandon seems like he's not in a hurry at all. They practice this plenty of times. You got Robert Ward on the crew chief roll here. Tires are in. Brandon's back on the bike. Great pit stop from TOBC Racing. Champ. A couple seconds, couple seconds longer than Danny's, I would say, but nice clean race. Or nice clean pit stop. Yeah. Great overhead shot from our crew. And I just watched Escalante come across the, the stripe. He's got Danny Estick right behind him. He's got Josh Hayes right behind him. So look, Brandon Posh probably going to lose a little bit of time. These three guys, this is your lead trio at the moment. So we're going to, and you can see there's Josh Heron just back there. And there's Posh coming out of pit lane. Now this is important for Brandon to not get too worked up. He's got to go out and around here. He sees those four guys. He wants to get on the back of him. He's got a fresh tire. But again, Greg, now he's going to have to push his own win. So this next stint could prove to be a little bit harder for Brandon in the sense that he's got to be careful on this outlap as well. These three are all tied together. Escalante, Eslick, Hayes. They've got a bit of a gap right now over Heron, who will do everything he can to catch up as he gets out over the yellow paint on the exit of that second horseshoe. Boy, you can really see the physicality of Josh Heron as he can see that lead group right up there. And it's that extra two or three seconds in the pits, even if he had an equal outlap, because we know Josh Heron can do it. But that could be the difference in this second stint on how hard Heron has to push. And again, Greg, we've lost, what we lost? Three of our main protagonists in Chubby Forrest, Cam Peterson and Ty Scott. But now you look at the pit stops. Who have we lost that was in that lead group, Greg? I don't see Hayden Gillum very close, and I don't see P.J. Jacobson very close. So those are the guys that maybe didn't have quite the best outlap or the best pit stop, and now they're going to have a lot of work to try to make this time back up to these three, four, five guys at the front. And the thing is, with this second stint that we look at in the Daytona 200, as we get to our next pit window, it's who's going to be able to extend it at speed more. The bike that's better on fuel makes a difference because if you think about it, once the sighting lap starts, the bikes can't refuel. So you've actually added two laps to the 19 laps that these bikes went to get in there. So now PJ is getting right back on the back of Brandon Posh. That's actually going to be hugely beneficial for Posh and for PJ if they can close that gap. Josh Hayes just ran the fastest lap of the race at a 48.6. The thing I think right now that I see is Heron, even though he's got to make up about 1.8 seconds to that first three, I think he has the pace to actually be able to do that. If Brandon didn't have PJ with him, I think it would be much more difficult. And you can see Hayden Gillum uh, just he's, back. He's, he's, he's kind of in out. no man's land. Yeah, hung out is a very good term. This guy, I believe, has the pace to draw these three back in. He is riding awful hard. And this is when you've got to, like, Hopefully, try not to be too frantic. You want to try to catch that lead group again and get on terms with them. Hayden Gillum right now, especially being one of the bigger guys, not having someone to draft with it will be a little bit more difficult. So we'll see if he can close that gap to those other two guys. I think we're going to have four at the front within a matter of three laps, and the, the other three might have a little bit of a problem. Just like these riders in the Daytona 200 on that first lap of 57, how once you get onto the racetrack and the light goes off and you get to racing, the nerves start to melt away. Same thing applies to these teams that are in the pits. After they get that first pit stop done, the second pit stop tends to be a lot more comfortable. And there is time to be made up in the pits. So for riders like Hayden Gillum, who's in seventh, P.J. Jacobson and Brandon Posh, the opportunity to try to make up time. And there's also tire strategy. Don't forget last year, the TOBC team with Brandon Posh, they didn't make a tire change. They only added fuel. So they saved a bunch of time in the pits and that ended up winning them the race. If you remember the amount of laps that he had on those Pirelli tires last year, did Brandon Posh was pretty incredible. But don't you think that, that a lot of that was because of how little he was abusing them? You got to remember, he was getting towed around the bankings and he was being patient in the infield. And I think that that was something that really played off to him. And that is a strategy that team are now going to have to start taking into part if they're this far back. So we're looking right now, 48-3 for Josh Heron that last time by, Greg. So he is only 0.8 of a second now behind Hayes. Ooh. So like I said, you're going to have those front four guys now are, are disappearing into the distance to these two. And uh, that's what they've got. to. Even though these guys are kind of going the same pace, they're not getting closer. And that's going to be the problem. 
Josh Heron, a 48-3. Yeah. Fastest lap of the race. I mean, he's doing that. On, faster yeah, than qualifying. Faster than qualifying. Yeah. On fresh tires, but with that full fuel, fuel load. When they're in qualifying, they're not doing that. It's that little bit of anxiety. You got to almost feel like hey, Heron was thinking, I got to put in almost two qualifying laps right now to try to close that gap. Once he gets there, he can kind of be a little bit patient. And his crew are going to go down and figure out, okay, what can we do to be a little bit better in our next pit stop to give our guy the best chance to not have to fight so hard and wear out my tires early in a stint in order to take him to the finish line. The Daytona 200 continues to race on. There's about 34 and a half laps to go. When we come back, we'll have more race action coming at you. Well, the first round of pit stops for the key players has come to its conclusion by our tracking. Richie Escalani had the fastest one, and unfortunately for Hayden Gillum, as you see him well back right now, uh, he's struggling because of a slow stop at this stage. But the two things that are catching my eye right now, Michael, are one, Josh Hayes, just a couple laps ago, set fast lap of the race. Now, Josh Heron has since taken it away, but Hayes said, I'm going to put in 57 relentless laps and make them stick with me. So uh, they're doing it. But this pace, incredibly good. I think it's because it's a lot cooler today than it was during qualifying. Yeah, a lot cooler today. And uh, we're seeing some incredible lap times. And you talk about those pit stops. And, uh, Roger, one of the riders that did not have the best pit stop was the number 96 of uh, Brandon Pash, the defending champion here. And he has been given a pit lane speeding offense. Now, uh, we don't know whether that's a ride through or a time penalty, but there is a speeding offense for uh, for, for Brandon Pash. And he's got to serve the, the penalty. Yeah, and that's going to hurt those chances big time when we go back to the Mav booth and Greg White. Welcome back to the World Center of Racing here at Daytona International Speedway as the Daytona 200 is right in the middle of race action. And there has been some drama. We've had Chavi Forrest, Cameron Peterson, and Ty Scott out of this. We're looking at the four in the lead group, Rishi Escalante leads the way in the 54. Josh Heron has made his way up to the back of Escalante. In doing so, has the fastest lap of the race at a 148.2. Danny Eslick is there, and Josh Hayes, P.J. Jacobson back there. Hayden Gillum trying to find their way to bridge the gap. And Jason, the 96 of Brandon Posh, has been, well, he's got a speeding on pit lane violation as we wait to see what that's going to be. A minimum of 15 seconds added to the time. Yeah, so that's going to really be that's going to hurt him uh, as far as that goes. And so we're going to we'll have to have a look at that and, um, you know, see what what Motor America does as far as that penalty goes for speeding. But, uh, you know, Greg, one of the things that's interesting about this, we had four riders at the front last year. There's one of those four in this group. That's Josh Hayes. So the other three guys we've seen. As we said, Cam Peterson's out. Posh isn't in this group, and unfortunately, Sheridan Marias didn't get to join us today after an incident earlier this week, got injured. So Hayes just finds himself right back where you'd expect that number four to be, and um, he's done a really good job so far. I mean, tip of the cap to the Squid Hunter team as well. Not a regular in the Super Sport class all season long. Coming to the Daytona 200 and just doing an outstanding job of race prep as well as these pit stops. And when you think about it, when I've been, I've been keeping a close eye on the timing screen, and it's gone from about five seconds now where PJ in fifth place was behind to seven seconds. So some of that might be traffic, but more than anything, you've got four riders drafting and redrafting, and, and it, when you get a group like this, as fast as these four are, as Danny Essex looks like, he's just losing touch with them, doesn't it? Just a little bit right now, Danny Essex losing a little bit of touch. Jason, taking a look at these front three here, Josh Heron and Josh Hayes have a lot of laps spun together over their careers. Richie Escalante does not have a lot of time. Looks like someone's making a pass for the lead here. It's Josh Hayes and Heron slots in right behind him. As I was saying, Richie doesn't have a lot of experience running out front with the two of these guys. So, you know, it's definitely going to be different. It's a little bit unpredictable. But talking to Richie as we approach the halfway part of this race, I said, what did you do to prepare for such an endurance race? He said he practiced on a cart track or a little bigger than a cart track, doing 30 lap stints at a time, making sure that he gets in about 100 a day. So he definitely feels physically fit for the task, but Josh Heron and Josh Hayes are certainly not making it easy on him right now. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And you can, you know, th that could be that could be somewhat punishing at, at a go-kart track doing that many laps and sticking out there for that long. Uh, you know, Daytona, Greg, has never been a super physical place. 
um, you, because I think that you've, you've got to try to take care of your equipment the best that you can. And, um, you know, but again, Escalante coming from Superbike, as you can see, Danny Eslick has definitely lost touch with these. They're 49-0, 49-0, and 48-6 for Hayes that last time by. Danny Eslick is at 50.4. So, and PJ Jacobson and, and Posh come across at 50.3, 50.4 respectively. They've now dropped 8.2 and 8.3 seconds back. So now, Greg, it's starting to look like we have a three horse race for the lead. Um, I'm just trying to see what's going on with Danny back there uh, to see why he's maybe just a tick off the pace. Yeah, it's really hard to say. And if you're keeping track of our timing and scoring pylon on the left side, you can see that Cameron Peterson, who had to pull into the pits early, earlier on in the race, is out there in ninth position, and he's doing 150.6 lap times, right around what PJ Jacobson and Brandon Posh are doing in the fifth and sixth spot currently. As we await to find out when Brandon Posh will get the addition of his 15 seconds added on to his time, and they're going to assess it at the end of the race, is what we're being told, okay. JP. All right. All right. So there's been three riders so far, so it's critical to get that motorcycle down to pit lane scene. So. 32 laps to go in the Daytona 200, the 2023 edition. Richie Escalante, who has looked to be the strongest coming out of the chicane all race long. He pulls this gap, and then you have the number one plate of Josh Heron, number four, Joshua Kurt Hayes. Yeah, Heron just loses a little bit of time in the middle of that chicane. It looks like a couple of the other bikes are, are really comfortable going over the paint in the first right part of it, and they stay under whatever bump it is that Heron's hitting out in the middle. And uh, Hayes the same. Hayes is nice and tight through the middle of that chicane. And we saw Danny Essek made reference to that earlier uh, in the show here where we were talking about how that triumph turn. Hayes and Escalante do a lot of that kind of same thing where Heron just lets it run out a little bit in the middle of the chicane and just loses ever such a little bit of time. Mission Vision Wheel M4X Star Suzuki. That's a GSXR 750. That's Richie Escalante, Warhorse HSBK Racing, Ducati New, York, New York's Josh Heron on the Pentagali V2 against the tried and true Yamaha R6 of Josh Hayes on that Squid Hunter racing machine. A well prepped motorcycle. Hayes has a look over his shoulder to see what's going on. Richie Escalante, of course, the first rider, non American rider to possibly win the Daytona 200 since 2008. Chaz Davis back in the day. Still so many laps to go and a variety of lap traffic to contend with. You know, for Josh Hayes, he's going to be out there thinking about, you know, he's got so much experience, doesn't he? I mean, he's just done so many laps, so many places. And, uh, if, you know, for Hayes right now, he just wants to sit there, not lose the toe of the two in front of him, do whatever he can do. We've got three different manufacturers uh, running first, second, and third, which is really fun to see. Suzuki, Ducati. Yamaha there and who better than to be on that Yamaha than Josh Hayes with all the experience he's got and uh, you know he looked how to look over his shoulder Greg I'm sure he's getting some plus signs on his board back to Danny and he's probably wondering why that's gone up ever so slightly but uh, he's got his head down and he's got to just try to stay with these lead two. The Squid Hunter team and the M4 team both had tremendous pit stops so uh, you know he's going to know that his team is capable of getting him in and out of the pits Hannah. Jason, you're absolutely right, and Josh Hayes feels that that is one of the most crucial aspects of this monster of a race is getting out of the, the pit stops really cleanly. Talking to him a little bit, you mentioned at the beginning of this race that broken ankle he suffered during the off season. He did crash that motorcycle at Barber and it was destroyed, so they have rebuilt this motorcycle from the ground up, but to the same spec as last year. He learned a lot settings-wise from racing some of the Moto America rounds last year that has really improved the bike overall this weekend. He did watch last year's race back quite a few times and said he could see he wasn't aggressive enough through the infield. So that's definitely part of his strategy here as well. Oh man, that's that's some traffic there that when you get hung up like that, all those guys were able to make it through. But uh, you know, when they went to that second horseshoe, but back to your point, Hannah, you know, it's he, Josh always going to learn. I, I think the neat thing about him is, you know, I get to see him a lot out at uh, Chuckwalla and in Valley Raceway. and. The thing is, is he had a lot of questions to me about my ankle uh, during the offseason because I have had a similar kind of injury. Um, he's been able to get his really sorted and taken care of. And I think he did a really nice job of 
taking it easy when he was told to take it easy, and uh, now he's going to get hung out, though. This is a big problem right now for Hayes. These two guys in front of him got through the lappers cleanly, and now he's in the chicane and gets held up. So now we're going to see. Hayes ran a lot of laps on his own this weekend. I watched him. He was the first one out Thursday morning. Let's see if he can close these two back down. On the high banks at Daytona, the draft and pass maneuver. A couple of next generation bikes, and you can see Josh Heron's head moving around in the buffeting of the draft. That's very standard as to what happens. Let's take a look at the bobble. It wasn't so much a bobble. I think Heron was trying to make the decision. Yeah, I could see they just ran over some bumps, but he was trying to make the decision to go down the inside of the outside. He chose the outside, which is a very natural thing to do, and then. You know, the, the rider in front probably heard him there and didn't want to get in the way and, and so on. So no big deal for Josh. He's probably had that happen a, a few times uh, in his career as far as coming up on the back of somebody. Josh Heron I'm talking about right now. And uh, this, is the, this is where that happened last time. And you can see, Greg, he's just done a really good job of closing that cat back down, hasn't he? He's just right behind them as they come out of that second horseshoe. Right part of your screen is Hayden Gillum. And P.J. Jacobson, so Gillum was able to get by P.J. for fifth spot. Brandon Posh, Teague Hobbs, Cam Peterson. Jeff May back in 10th spot with Matt Trulove doing a great job. Taylor Knapp, Ben Young, and Blake Davis with Jason Farrell. A race winner from last year in Moto America's Super Sport class. Farrell in 15th spot. Hauling off into the chicane, off the back straightaway. Lap traffic in the way again. Escalante trying to figure out the best line to take. That's just going to close all those three back up, and that's all you need. And Hayes is probably thanking that guy right now and saying, all right, that's cool. I, now I can kind of sniff the two guys in front of me's draft and try to get him back, back, back behind them. And uh, like you say, Gillum now, that, that battle for fifth, is almost 10 seconds back. So they've just kind of been losing there about five or six seconds back initially, Greg, and now they're they're 10, and Hayes is drawn right up on the back of these two again. They're gonna encounter probably two or three more riders here this lap just through the infield alone. Hayes right there. Jay, the one thing we haven't seen from the number four is any fight on the bank. Oh, it's Hayes, locks up the rear. All right, he did a good job there of just keeping the bike on track. So you can see it was almost like he missed a shift or something or it went into a gear or false neutral and jumped into gear. Did you see how it went sideways? And did you see him trying to shift the bike on the exit of the corner? So that tells me that, that maybe he had a bike get in between gears and they've caught Jason Farrell, who Jason Farrell right now running 15th place. He's going to be a little bit harder guy to pass. And he's going to look, that's, that's, that's a pretty savvy move by him. He saw the blue fags, looked over, and you're going to see here, Josh gets in there. He's probably trying to get it into gear right now, and it went down maybe one too many. Now, if you watch his left foot, he's going to, I didn't get to see it, but the thing is, is that it kind of tells me that either, he was either fishing for a gear or it got stuck between gears or something, and um, he's got to do that work all over again, Greg, to to try to pull back up. Jason Farrell look over his shoulder and a wave by to these guys. Yeah, but Farrell's got a pretty fast he Kawasaki does. ZX6R, and that might help Josh Hayes if he can get around him and close this gap. Looks like Cameron Peterson on the attack. Yamaha is in the pits. He was in ninth place. The question is how much of a gap does he have to stay in the top 10? One of our early race favorites, Cameron Peterson, Unfortunately, had some drama early on in the race. He had to pit early and lost a bit of time talking to the team. As we think it might be something to do with a shifting issue. Now they've kind of figured that whole situation out. Up front, here we have Richie Escalante and Josh Heron. Jason, we kind of talked about this, and we think from the pace that we've seen from Josh Heron all weekend long, that he was definitely one of the favorites. Josh Hayes still right there. Man, it's just like... I love Josh Hayes. I really do. I think that it's amazing that he can just keep clawing these guys back and he's doing it on his own, you know, and, you know, he just has that experience again where it's, all right, I got to get through the chicane a little quicker. I got to close this, bridge this gap back to these guys. He ran that time great, a 50.1, so he only lost three tenths of a second, even with that bobble that you saw down there in that first horseshoe. So the four has got right back on the back of them. So the three leaders, Escalante, Heron, and Hayes going after it as we get closer to our second pit stop window. 
We'll take a break when we come back. More race action from the Daytona 200. Well, we are most definitely seeing the old adage playing out beautifully. Traffic giveth, traffic taketh away uh, because traffic has played a big role. But in total, we're right back. These three have made well and truly the big break. Yeah, it's a really great race. This is an enthralling game of uh, high-speed chess, as you just said off air when we're watching this. Three different manufacturers as well, Roger, with the Suzuki, the Ducati, and the Yamaha. These new next-generation rules once again giving us great racing, and this race is not disappointing. No, not at all. These three, we definitely we thought about, you know, the first pit stop. As you see Hayden Gillum there. Lost a lot of time during his pit stop, but he's doing the lap times faster than the leaders. So, uh, you know, if a, if a red flag or something comes out, he could be a guy that could get back in the mix of this. But uh, right now we got three guys. Uh, I don't think any of those three are going to get away, but you see the lappers coming into those, and, you know, it's easy to make a mistake. You want to hurry up and pass that lapper and try to get a gap, but is the risk worth the reward if you go down? Yeah, you just mentioned Hayden Gillum. He's now uh, caught up to Danny Eslick and overtaken him, as has P.J. Jacobson. So this little trio now uh, is the second trio on circuit, Greg. Uh, if anything goes wrong at the front, this is also the fight for the podium. There's a long way to go in this race. Lots of distance yet in these three. Yeah, I mean, if they can work together and if anybody up front, you know, has a little bobble that just slows everybody down, hits a big clump of traffic, something like that, they could be right in it. Uh, but Gay uh, Gillum has been impressive because that pit stop of his was pretty slow, and he has just put in relentless laps, as you said, Roger, and uh, has got, you know, Brandon Posh gets a penalty, then he, but he gets by... PJ, he gets by Danny Eslick, he's back up into fourth and giving it everything he can. Yeah, and he just has to keep his head down and then maybe the next pit stop, hopefully they don't make that mistake and anything can happen and oh, PJ's down. Oh, big off by PJ and we're gonna send it back to the map booth to pick it up. Just moments before we came back in the infield section, PJ Jacobson lost the front jp he is down i was just literally thinking to myself watching it i was thinking oh, he's he's still using that outside line a little bit and we we saw herring get caught out on that bump and that's exactly what happens here you're gonna be trailing off into there just a little bit and when you go over that thing with any kind of maybe a little bit of lever on and you hit some bumps this is what can happen and pj jacobson goes down another one of our main contenders is going to be eliminated from this you can see Hayden Gillum and himself had both caught up to Danny Eslick in that battle for fourth. And you see Brandon Posh makes it through also. But P.J. Jacobson goes down to the second horseshoe, and that will be his race run, I believe. Back up to the front. If you're new to motorcycle road racing, that crash that P.J. Jacobson had, we call that a typical low side crash. Or when we say lose the front, that means he lost front and traction, and down he went. Lead change, Josh Heron goes to the front on his number one plated Warhorse HSBK Racing Ducati New York, Ducati V2. The first time in his career, as Hannah told us earlier, that Heron has been able to run the number one plate and the only time this year that we'll see it on his bike, as we think anyway, because he's moving up to back up to the Superbike class. Of course, the former Superbike champion in his own right. You see that little look over his shoulder? Yeah. That's, that is, did I get through that back marker better than these two guys behind me? You might see him push really hard before he gets up onto this banking because if he doesn't feel that anybody's drafting him again, we saw him go 48. What did he do, what did he do earlier? 48-2? And I think he did 48-3 catching them. Yeah, he did. You know, yep. in, in the in his The two own, laps leading up to him catching were 48-3, 48-2. He had to run a, a, and catch back up to these guys. And that little gap, even though it doesn't look like much on TV and it can get closed up quickly, it's another one of those things where if he can get through the chicane or get through that next uh, tail ender a little bit quicker and a little bit easier, that will help him. Now, these guys are going to try to work together to catch him. They're going to go running off into the chicane, Greg, and try to close that gap back up so they can get back into the draft of the one. And he's going to get held up here in the chicane, Greg. Yeah, unless the 270 takes that different line. Yeah, exactly right. So that wider line that Heron had to take to try to get around that lap traffic, and it's closed right back up to you. What I was going to say about Escalante is Hayes is no help in the draft to Escalante because Hayes can't get up there. So if anything, Hayes is dragging Escalante back because he's that far back in the draft, but all for naught because the middle of the chicane and Escalante is right there again. Now this is what helps Hayes. Having a two bike draft, punching a big hole in the air, and there goes the Yamaha R6. He gets right up onto the back of his competitors. Who's gonna lead into turn number one? It looks like it's going to be Escalante as they run up on the 292. That's Vergas. 
And, and that's going to be a bad spot, too. And you can oh, see Josh is kind of hung out. He's going to have to go up the inside and take a tighter line. Yeah, well, I did some some text message training with Hayes before the race. And uh, we always make a couple jokes about things. I said, hey, I'm going to I'm going to lay my money on. I, yeah, I think we've you know, some luck has been changed today with uh, the Twins Cup class. Stefano Mesa did a great job for for Melissa Paris in that. And I was kind of thinking things could change. Josh says, I don't know if I've got the bike underneath me to draft at the line, he says. I don't know about that. I just saw him be able to get in that draft of both these two in front of him and pull up alongside of them coming across the line. So, you know, for me, looking at where, where Hayes is at right now, he's been able to fall back and catch back up. He's been able to draft these guys and time things at the line, Greg, where I think that it could be pivotal for him as the, as the laps start to wind down. So, we're starting to get into that uh, that area where people will start to be thinking about pit stops again in a, in what probably five laps from now. So uh, look at the traffic going down into the chicane, and Hayes is going to get held up really bad right now, Greg. He's going to have to have two guys that he's going to have to get by, and the leaders are out in front and splitting away. The 103 is Alex Arango. He's just up ahead of Hayes. He's actually had some good speed. He's in 20th place. He's done 155. Arango came out of our second qualifying group, so there were so many riders trying to get into this Daytona 200 that they split them up into two groups, and Alex Arango was one of the faster of those riders. So Hayes now gets hung out to dry just a little bit, and now Hayes has got a lot of work to do, JP. You're not lying about Arango's bike. Josh followed him all the way from the chicane, all the way to the start-finish line, and was able to outbreak him going down into one. So Arango, with some good speed, as he's in 19th place right now, uh, and, and now we're going to see again, can Hayes pull this pin and catch back up to the two in front of him? Hayden Gillum running strong in fourth, 11 seconds back. He's got Eslick with him and Posh just behind him. Teague Hobbs seventh, May eighth. Matt Trulove now finds himself inside the top ten in ninth. And Taylor Knapp doing a really good job in tenth place. Tip of the cap to the Top Pro Motorsports team that puts that bike under Arango out of Corral Springs, Florida. So Hayes now really has to start pushing the issue. We expect riders to come in. There's 23 laps to go. Our pit window is going to start somewhere around the 18 to 17 laps to go. It depends on the strategy of the teams. It depends on fuel mileage as well. I mean, teams want to stretch it out as long as they can to have the freshest possible tires towards the end. Additionally, Jason, the longer you can go after the second pit stop, if you can make it 17 laps to go versus 18 or even 16 laps to go, the less fuel you'll have to put in the bike. That's exactly right. And, you know, this is, again, do you take a chance like Posh took last year? How good did the tires look? The technicians from these riders, they, they, they're looking at the tires from the first stint and looking at the drop-off in lap times. Could somebody take a shot and not do a tire change? You know, you, it'd be very, very unlikely of these top three guys to be willing to take that chance. But that is a chance that you would have to take if you were a guy that didn't think that you could draft up or if you've lost touch. Like, it looks like Hayes has lost a little bit of touch right now with these guys in front of him. And it looks like he's going to catch somebody going down into turn one again as well. But Josh Hayes, that lap by 48-4 for Escalante, 48-6 for Heron, 49-0 for Hayes. So Escalante right now trying to put a big push before this next pit stop in order to try and get some sort of gap. He's not going to be able to do that over Heron, and they have really now dropped Josh Hayes off the back. Riders looking over their shoulders. The leader's coming by, 54 leading the way, the one, and back there is the number four. Also, Jason, I want to mention, we talked about tire wars, and these top three riders in this race are on Dunlops. Dunlop hasn't won this race in five years. They have put a lot of development into their Daytona tires, specifically for this class. So I know the crew down underneath the Dunlop canopy are smiling right now, but there's still plenty of laps to go. 21 and a half as Escalante searching for grip going up onto the banking. Heron gets into the tuck to relax. Jay, this banking is crazy. As they get to the top speeds in the 170 plus mile an hour, it actually can be relaxing for a rider, can it? No, it definitely can. And, and you know, these two guys, 
they know each other really well, and uh, as does most of our, our field. Uh, they know each other's idiosyncrasies as Heron is going to go back up the inside of Escalante in what now has become a two-rider race at the front. Remember, Greg, we started with some eight riders, I believe, at the front of this before our first pit stop, and that kind of has just been started to get weeded out some of the other guys due to whatever the reasons might be. But, uh, you know, the thing is now, these two guys, once they go by their board, it, whenever they're in second place, they're going to see that they've got a big plus number on their board back to Hayes now. It's going to be probably close to plus two or plus three when they go through that infield on this next time by. We're going to look at the lap times, looking at 49.5, 49.0, 49.8 for Hayes pushing his own win. So Heron right now, when he goes by the board, they're going to come out of this left right here, and you're going to go down to this international horseshoe. When they come out of this turn, well, now it's going to be Escalante as Heron is in way too deep, Greg. Way Ooh. too deep there. That's a big mistake. So now he is going to see, it's probably going to say plus three or four on his board, or plus two at least back to Hayes. And uh, he's going to realize that they're starting to gap him a little bit. They can focus on each other a little more. Don't forget, Escalante was our first of our top riders that came into the pits. So the question is, when are they going to have Escalante, he had a great pit stop. He had a 14 second pit stop. Then Heron came in after and had a 17 second pit stop and has had to make up quite a bit of time. I think the question is, Jason, is how much fuel is being used when you're pushing your own air versus when you're in the draft? Is it a conservation if you're in the draft or not? And how much tire do you have left yeah, too? Because 100%. we saw him have to chase down and do these lap times that were below what he qualified at for pole position. So it's kind of a combination. Yeah, you can do some fuel conserving. And I think, again, that's what Posh did so well last year. He was able to conserve a little bit. He was able to take care of his tires a little bit. The mistakes that you see there when you see Josh Heron running a little bit deep into the horseshoe, those are the ones you want to try to eliminate the best you can because now he's got to put his head back down to try to catch up to, to Escalante once again. Richie Escalante, a good lead onto the banking. With coming across the stripe, it'll be 20 laps to go here in the Daytona 200. And a bike down, it's no, it's the 95 of Hayden Gillum. Both the leaders look, this is in the chicane, but it looked to me like both the leaders were coming down pit lane, Greg. And I'm going to have a look at it when they come through. Richie Escalante and Heron are both on pit lane. Hayden Gillum goes down in the middle of the chicane, Greg. So both our leaders cruising down pit lane together. Man, the pressure of these teams right now to make sure that they can get their rider out first. Here comes Escalante in. They haven't even put the fuel in yet, but he's going front and rear tire. The fuel's in. Heron, left part of your screen. The Ducati crew getting to work. There goes the fuel. Now, of course, where Escalante's team is is further down pit lane. Are they going to come out together? Heron looks like he might have an advantage. He's trying to get it in gear. He loses another second or two, but it's got to be Heron who comes out of the pit first. There goes the pit lane speed limiter released by Richie Escalante. So Heron's got that much of a lead through the infield. Now we're going to see who's done their homework the best of getting out of pit lane. Now it's a very narrow pit. I loved how Heron got out of here last time. And you're going to see he's going to run that right knee right up along these cones, Greg, as he goes through there. That's only about six feet wide. So the, uh, and he's going to look back and he is right now thanking his team under his helmet for that unbelievable pit stop. And he's going to get out. And this guy, we've always known at the beginning of races on new tires, this guy knows how to put down the laps early. We're going to get a, a direct indication. We'll be able to look at our splits and see exactly what he has gained in this pit stop. Josh Heron sets sail for the last part of this race. We think pit stops are over for this guy. He's got 19 and a half laps to go. We'll see how he does on the other side. Well, we talk about how the crew can make a difference in these endurance races with the stops, and I'll tell you what, uh, that Warhorse Racing Ducati NYC crew just uncorked a beauty, Michael. Yeah, that was uh, poetry in motion. They came in together, they exited a couple of seconds apart, and you've got to say, uh, Josh Heron, he got that exit to pit lane nailed, didn't he? He looked like he was on rails. Escalante just a little bit cautious, as now we see the third rider from that leading trio, Josh Hayes coming down in towards uh, pit lane. Now it's his turn. He's not out of this, Roger, but this uh, 
The Squid Hunter team, they've got to nail this. Yeah, they got to nail this. And, you know, Josh is going to make up a lot of time getting off pit lane in those first laps. That's where he's excelled at all throughout his career. So, you know, he's a little bit back, but with the lappers, we've been yeah. talking about that all day. You never know what can happen. There's still 19 laps left, so you just got to stay in it and see if something happens. And Josh needed that stop because clearly his tires were gone. I think they were gone because he had to make up that gap. Yep from the last pit stop and was by himself. So he's pushing his own air and, uh, you know, that pit stop was great. I think that team had a little, wanted to prove something. They didn't win that pit stop challenge last night. You're absolutely right. Yeah, issues it seems for uh, TLBC at the front. Danny Eslick, uh, any hope he had of uh, setting that record seems to be uh, gone. Let's head back uh, across to uh, the boys to take us through the final 19 laps here. More to come, Daytona 200. Frantic pit stops happening in the Daytona 200. The second time Danny Esla comes in and his TOBC team struggled hard to get him out of the pits. While we were at break, Josh ha ha Hayes came in. He was in third spot and they had a nice clean pit stop as well. So Danny Esla and the team was trying to get those axles set, Jason. Yeah, and the front wheel and you could see him. He was a little bit panicked. You, it, as a rider, you, you, you know, you're, you're literally 35 seconds when you leave pit lane away from getting yourself well back up over to 100 mile an hour so you want to make sure that everything feels good and comfortable you saw him looking over the front of that bike but i'm i'm looking at that heron escalante from their outlap in and it, it was a two second difference for heron uh over escalante on that lap so that's the two seconds that can make or break you and uh, we're getting a good look at eslick at the moment he's just keep shaking his head he knows what was lost in the pits and so it, up and it, but it happens here, doesn't it? it? I mean, we've seen it so many times where those pit stops are crucial. As I can see Brandon Posh also has just come into the pits. You can see that, that uh, Young is in the pits. Blake Davis is in the pits as well. This is the 96 bike. We're looking at the overhead shot. The TOBC racing team right back at it. This one looking good. As you can see the axle goes right in. A nice clean stop for Brandon Posh. So out he goes onto the pit lane speed limiter. Of course, he's got a 15 second penalty added to his time at the end of the race, as long as he didn't exceed the pit lane speed this time out. As soon as he crosses that stripe, it's game on. Jason, what are you seeing I, right now with lap times? I have just been studying this. Like while you've been talking, Greg, Escalante has got his head down. He goes 49-1. Heron went 50.2. So. Heron probably had a problem with, with uh, maybe a back marker or something. We've seen him be able to run 48s. Now he knows Escalante has chased him back down. Now it's going to be a chess match all the way to the finish of this race. Who's going to be able to conserve their tires the best and have a run out of that chicane on the last lap? I think that what I have seen so far, Escalante is extremely quick through the middle and out of that chicane. So he's going to be able to put that in his back pocket and he's going to have some confidence. It's going to give him a lot of confidence knowing that he's been able to run the number one of Josh Heron back down. It's amazing that we see the G6R 750. There's PJ Jacobson coming back into pit lane. So he got that bike back up, didn't he? He got that bike back up. We don't see him in our top 20 at the moment. So he got that bike back up probably already pitted once now he's come back in again this might just be a routine stop although I maybe he didn't come back in Greg I'm not sure because you would have thought that they probably would have changed tires and things before but man no, no real problems with that motorcycle it doesn't look like for PJ that you see the leaders are coming to the tri oval right now as PJ's crew get that bike fired up and get him back out he'll be going another lap down there's the two leaders on that right screen you saw the two leaders flash by off into turn one Hey, Heron just a little bit wide again down there into turn one and we've seen him do that a couple times as well as the as well as the horseshoe long race 17 laps to go just amazed at the fuel economy that both these riders are getting out of their bikes and that they feel that they can go 20 laps confidently on those Dunlop tires both are getting snapped around a little bit out of the seat saw that out of the horseshoe there and uh, so Heron a little bit out of turn one but you know, they're going to know now that they've got, what do they have? Let's see, over Josh Hayes right now, seven and a half seconds back. Hayes has come through in third. And you're going to have Posh, 24 seconds back total to these guys. And we know that he's going to have a penalty assessed to him, as you have said. T. Hobbs is fifth place right now, Greg. And then you got Jeff May, Camp Peterson, Taylor Knapp, Gillum, and True Love 
Some of this will continue to change around a little bit as the pit stops sort themselves out. Seventeen laps to go. More penalties being assessed from timing and scoring from the last pit stop. Flurry of pit stops. Wow. Blake Davis, I see there on the screen, Greg. Yep. He, he got pit. He, he got one also, didn't he? Uh, Damian Jagalov also with a penalty. And there's Jeff May coming in, and you heard Jeff May before the start of this race saying this could quite possibly be his last Daytona 200. We've seen Jeff at the front of Superbike races in the past. He's been a, a long, long career for Jeff May, and this could be maybe his last pit stop at the Daytona 200. There goes the 99 out onto the racetrack with 16 laps remaining in the 2023 edition of the Daytona 200. Back to our top two, Richie Escalante on that mission, Vision Wheel M4 X star Suzuki, the one-off appearance for him this year in this next generation super sport category as he continues to fly the flag in the Superbike class in Moto America, as is the rider right behind him, Josh Heron. And for Josh Heron, if he can win this race, Jason, he won it back in 2010. The rider who has the largest gap in years between the, their first race win and their most recent race win is who? Miguel Duhamel. Miguel Duhamel, 14 years from the first time Miguel won it to his last time he won it. For Josh Heron, if he can pull this win off, it'll be 13 years from his first to his latest. Let's get to Hannah. Greg, as you guys mentioned at the start of this race, Josh Heron lost almost 20 pounds from last season for this race specifically, doing a lot of mountain bike riding, not hitting the weight so much. He feels better on this bike and even on the super bike for the season ahead. He has been working with Roger Hayden quite a bit as a new rider coach. He said Roger is very detail oriented, very passionate, so he feels lucky to have someone out there spotting for him and helping him throughout the weekend. And Roger Hayden, of course, part of our Moto America Live Plus crew which you can make sure you go to MotoAmerica.com and get yourself a Moto America Live Plus subscription for this season with video on demand and all the race action, including practice and qualifiers coming at you during each weekend of the Moto America Championship, Moto America Live Plus. Now the gap to third, tremendous. Back to Josh Hayes, who is doing everything he can to push his own air. But Jason, as we continue with these laps, it's not over yet. There's still 15 to go. But for Josh Hayes, looking to break the all-time win record, it's starting to slip through his fingers. It is a little bit, and, and I really do believe it was the last quarter of his last stint where he, he just actually, to be honest with you, got a little bit of a run of bad luck getting through some of the back markers. And the one, the two guys that he caught in the chicane there uh, was really the backbreaker for him. And, you know, you saw him fighting and continue to fight to try to get back with the leaders. But at that point, when you lose the draft and you lose the toe around here, you lose so much time to two guys that are going to be working together. Um, and, and that's ultimately, I think, what cost Hayes a little bit in this race. And you saw there's P.J. Jacobs in the 66 just behind Josh Hayes. If you're just joining us, P.J. Jacobson, who you know would be a front runner in this race, crashed out or crashed earlier on in the race, and he is a lap down. P.J. credited right now with 19th position. So Josh Hayes up onto the banking in third place. He would enjoy a podium, Jason, without question, but there's only one position Josh Hayes likes at his advanced age, and that is <laughs> first position. You, you, I'm glad you said that. I, I <laughs> you know, and knowing Josh, he'll be back for another two or three years trying to win this race. And, you know, like I said, he keeps himself fit. And But, you know, when you got guys like these two, these two are going to be at the sharp end of our superbike grid this year in Moto America when we head off to Road Atlanta in about four weeks time we're going to see Escalante and Heron on super bikes and uh, you know they're they're young guys that are still working hard obviously a super bike champion in Heron already super sport champion he's won stock thousand I believe championship as well so you look at somebody like Heron right now he's still at the top of his game so Josh Heron leads the way from Richie Escalante to the infield when we come back there's 14 laps to go in the Daytona 200. You don't want to miss a moment of the action.
You know, through that uh, legendary international horseshoe, you run wide. There's a little bit of a seam there. It uh, has almost caught out Josh Heron. It caught out P.J. Jacobson. So you've still got to be mindful of the track itself. But, Roger, real quickly here, uh, explain to the people why the in-lap and the out-lap is so important on these stops. Well, just because you can make up time. You know, some guys are going to be a little bit sketchy because they got brand new tires where, you know, if you can get up to speed right away, you can maybe get two or three seconds, you know, those first couple corners when you pull out. So it's really important. And uh, you see what Josh Heron did. He was really good through there. And also getting on pit lane, trying to get down to that 50 mile an hour as late as possible, but also that risk. You can risk a pit lane penalty. And we've seen that happen. So there's, a, as is everything in racing, it's all about risk versus reward. And right now, Heron and Escalante, or Heron and Escalante indeed have risk perfectly at this stage. A lot of racing yet to go. The battle up front continues to rage during the Daytona 200, the 2023 edition. And the number one plate, Josh Heron on the Warhorse HSBK Racing Ducati, New York, Panigale B2, up high on the banks. And down low goes Richie Escalante, the rider from Mexico on the mission, Vision Wheel M4X Star Suzuki GSXR 750. So we have two different engine configurations, two different manufacturers, same tire brand Dunlop, two different countries, two different levels of experience going at it on the high banks of Daytona, Jason Pridmore. No question, and you know, I'm just sitting there and you know, we've seen for so many years, we've seen, you know, both the Lation and Heartbreak at this race, Greg, and these two guys now have separated themselves. And, you know, it's it, it seems like when you get into this position, you've just gotten to know the guy that you're around so well, and they've all tested each other. Everybody knows where everybody's breaking. Everybody knows what they have underneath them as far as their competitors go in, in, in the draft and how their bikes are working. And now it just becomes a strategy thing of, you know, you don't want to let go of the guy in front. And when is it that one of them decide to sit on each other? When is it that one of them decide, you know, is there a big enough advantage, Greg? Hold if, on, if hold on. Do people do that anymore, Jay? Yeah. Because I, I, I cast Brandon my Pops mind back to year. a 750 <laughs> Super Sport race between you and Ben Spees. And I watched you guys on the banking going so slow, you nearly slid down the banking. Yeah, well, that was the last lap. And, and, and Ben and I knew each other pretty well a little bit then, even though he was young. The thing is, is that, you know, Again, we, we go back, there's so many different ways of winning this race. I mean, one of the most astounding ones ever was Scott Russell, you know, falling off in the International Horseshoe, running to his bike, the iconic picture of him picking the bike up, uh, or jumping over his bike, picking it up, and coming back and, and winning um, will forever be something that I, I still don't believe that he did it, but he was so good around here, and he understood things. People, you know, when you talk to people, they're like, Scott used to be able to see the air or something around here, you yeah. know, and he, he was just so good, and, um, you know, it's strategy wise who's got the advantage here like who would you put your money on it's so difficult to say because they've all tested each other the same way every time they go across that trioval they're thinking to themselves okay i, I think i can nip him at the line and you can see heron with a very late downshift there really late downshift there so maybe it just didn't quite go into gear good to see he was able to get that thing sorted but yeah the strategy wise you just kind of think who's got the advantage right now and um, it, it's just, it's a, it's a hard game. And we got, what do we have left? 12 laps to go. And keep in mind, Ducati has only ever won the Daytona 200 back in 2011 with Jason DeSalvo. And that was a race that actually only went to 42 green flag laps. And that was one where we had an extended red flag. They ran out of time. That was a very unusual because this Daytona 200 run by the folks here at Daytona International Speedway, it is, it's got to go 200 miles. And so, for that day, that situation, very unusual. So this would be the first time, if Josh Heron can pull off this win, that a Ducati has won the Daytona 200 going the full 200 miles. As for Richie Escalante, Jay, this is the thing. When you know, you've seen Richie Escalante race for many years, as we have Josh Heron. The thing that defines both of these riders is aggression. I think, do we see on the last lap if it comes down to it? Because pit stops are done. My concern is fuel mileage. Both these riders are gonna have to go 20 laps at full sail, tire wear as well. So the question is, if somebody sees a crack, just a little bit of daylight, like right now if Escalante looked back and saw this distance, 
Is it a matter of I'm going to push as hard as I can to try to make that break? If you look at what just happened on this lap, Richie is so good through the middle of that chicane, and he gaps Heron about three, four to six bike lengths in the middle of the chicane to the exit. So I think that Richie, in my opinion, has a, a little bit of an advantage once he gets to the chicane. Now, whether he decides to be second out of there or lead, you just saw him go through the chicane and actually lead. There's a big mistake again from Heron in the International Horseshoe. And these are the mistakes that, that make it to where Heron has to work a little bit harder to, to catch back up to Richie again. But Escalante just showed me that he can lead from the chicane to the finish line. So, man, just so much right. And Heron's in deep again, Greg. He's man. into that second horseshoe. He's going to get out there over those bumps. And he's just now he's pushing. He's a little frantic trying to catch back up. Hannah? Jason, Richie said that he felt like he had pretty good pace by himself in a lot of our practice and qualifying sessions. Even this morning on a green track, he was happy to see himself get down into the 48s all by himself. He thinks he has the pace to try and pull away, but he said he's going to wait to really assess the situation. Obviously, I think he was expecting to be in a little bit of a bigger group here at the end. With him and Heron, it's just a waiting game. Richie knows that he needs to be patient in order to pull this off. When you look at the sheets, Hannah, uh, after a practice session or after qualifying, each rider will look through these. And, and you know, the thing is, is on paper, Greg, right, we, we can literally look and see 15 people mm -hmm. that we think. But it always kind of weeds itself out, and you start seeing little problems with different riders and things. We always think that there's going to be 15 riders at the end, and there never is, as Cam Peterson is back into the pits again. Frustrating day for the attack crew, obviously, and Cam himself. But here you go on the left side of your screen, Heron, can he draft by? And it looks like he can, but it's all going to be about that run out of the chicane. So Heron has now shown that he can draft past again. Heron, to me, is just that guy that doesn't ever go away. And that's what I've always loved about him, the tenacity to will his way to get to the front. I mean, 48-2 and 48-3, essentially by himself yeah. to catch back up. I mean, there's not a lot of riders that can just go do that. In fact, we haven't seen anybody else be able to do those kind of times. And he just never gives up, and that's what you got to love about him. Where this lead just started, though, Jason, yeah. was through the chicane. Yep. Josh Heron was taking a much tighter line that lap by. He took basically Richie Escalante's line. So I think Josh is still out there trying to play around with how do I get through this. Might have been as Escalante is going to go up the inside and push the issue as Heron's really struggling with some rear grip at the moment. The bike's really starting to, to move around under hard acceleration. Watch when he goes up out of the banking. Take a look at that rear Dunlop and see where he is. That one's see, just that yeah, little bit moving, of movement, not compared to Escalante, but let's look at what Heron does as they get to the chicane because I think he slowed it down mid-chicane wow. just ever so slightly. And got down there a little bit tighter in the middle of it because mm -hmm. I didn't get to see that one. So that's a nice catch by you there because that is exactly where, and you know, that's the thing is, he's, he's savvy. He's going to know what he needs to do. And now he's going to lead into the chicane. Now let's see. Does he keep it a little bit tighter in the middle? You know, again, you can see Escalante's bike turn in the middle of that chicane. Much better. And 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 for me, it's got to get through that chicane as good as you can. See how early Escalante can pull out of the draft when they leave that chicane? That's drive. That's just don't. pure getting through the chicane <laughs> and getting out of there quickly. Yeah, but the, the, sh the chicane, the, the start-finish line isn't on the banking. It's, it's where they're coming to now. So Heron's able to draft back past and lead coming across. And right now, these two are going across try over right now. If that was the end of the race, you wouldn't even know who was who was leading. Yeah, that was that was Heron by four thousandths of a second, which would have been nearly half of what the race finish was last year of the rider on the right, Brandon Posh, who is. I think it's Eslick, isn't it there? I think it's Danny oh, with, the, with the white. Yeah, hand. it's. Yeah, uh, is so, it Brandon? It is Brandon. Yeah, Posh. he's yeah. in fourth place currently, Brandon Posh. Josh Hayes up the road some way, so we'll get an idea of the 96 when he comes through and crosses start finish line. Because currently he's a lap down. It's 19 and a half seconds. It's 35 seconds behind the two on the left part of your screen are battle for first place and another 15.9 behind Josh Hayes. So barring some disaster for the top three, it looks like Brandon Posh oh. isn't going to be able to repeat and a little bit of lap traffic. Yep for Josh Heron. The door opens up for Escalante as Heron once again searching for rear end grip. Yeah, but he got out a little bit on the dirty stuff because of the action that he had to take to get past that, uh, to, to get past the back marker there, Greg. So 
Um, you know, I, I wouldn't really look at that too much. It's going to be a little bit dirty out there, and he's going to get that thing lit up. And I think that Heron was expecting this rider to, uh, he, he thought about going down the inside of him a minute, and then it looked to me like right now he wanted to tip down underneath it. And he was waiting for the guy to tip in, and, and it just never happened. So he ends up getting out there in that little dirty spot. You can see the thing light up. But if there's a guy who's comfortable getting it sideways, it is him. So... Again, Escalante with a good run out of the chicane. Now we're getting into that spot, Greg. Eight laps to go. Look at the traffic that they're... They're going to split the traffic off that bank and towards the tri-oval. Choosing different lines as the laps continue to wind down. It's eight to go for the 54, the one in the rest of this field. Heron oh, going up the inside man. and he takes him out. Wow. Oh. Escalante with nowhere to go and a surprise move from Heron. Oh, man. And just enough to clean Escalante out and he That's goes down. Not good. And he is not happy about that one. Yeah. Yeah, that is that's not good there. He wants to get back to the bike. He's going to try to pick it up. And uh, we're going to have to look at it and see if, you know, it, uh, and it looks like uh, the handlebar snapped off. And well, it looked like uh, electronics, the dashboard. Yeah, and right there, it's it's. Uh, I mean, Josh yeah. was in the bike was turned. He was in front of him. I mean, that just looks to me like a racing incident. Here goes Heron up the inside. Escalante is a little bit wider than normal. I mean, Heron's looking through the corner. He's by him. I don't know, Jay. Your call. You no, know, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one to uh, really see. You're going to see these guys have a look up on the screen now. Escalante visibly upset there on the right, as he should be. And uh, you know, eight laps to go, going down into one. I've got mixed feelings on it. I mean, I can see both sides of this right now. Um, you know, you're trusting the guy around you, especially at that point. It is a race. I mean, flat out, it is a race. And. Did Josh really do anything really wrong? It's hard to say. Escalante, I didn't think he was in wide myself. So um, uh, you know, these, yeah. guys, these guys have gone through that that turn 40-something laps together. You know, Jay, you and I have been doing this a long time. And oftentimes, when a rider feels like they're in a little bit hot, their natural reaction is going to be to kind of go down the inside. Yeah, and they're gonna, but they're going to look over to see where the other guy is sometimes. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, look, it either way, we're in the situation that we're in right now, which means Josh Heron leads the way over Josh Hayes. And just like that, that's going to move Brandon Posh into third place position. And Teague Hobbs, who's had a great run at it, will move his way into fourth spot. Yeah, it's uh, man, it's it's I'm a little bit. I'm a little bit in shock, if I'm being honest with you, about what just happened. And, you know, it, it, from the angles that we've seen, Heron made the decision he wanted to go down the inside and uh, pretty early. And he had he had a really late downshift in there, but we've seen him do that, too. I, you know, it's it's hard to call that any much more than than a, than a racing incident. It's just. Yeah. It's shocking to see it is because a bit shocking. I'm you not just lie. think that these two riders have settled into a pace. They're not going to mess with each other. They're going to leave it to the high banks to decide the race, and it just didn't happen that way. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to have our last six laps. Richie Escalante had a great run, but he is out early. We'll find out how this finish ends up. We'll take you to the checkered flag after this. Well, it looked like it would be a tire battle right to the end of this one with Josh Heron riding with uh, abandon and uh, it looked like Richie Escalante riding with controlled aggression. Well, Josh Heron making the big move down to the inside, contact, and Escalante goes down. It is under review, but at this stage, it is Josh Heron up front by over 20 seconds back to Joshua Hayes, back to the Mav booth. All alone on the high banks is the number one plate of Josh Heron on his Warhorse HSBK Racing Ducati New York Penagali V2. After an incident with leader Richie Escalante, those two were going back and forth all race long, and their two lines converged. In sixth place is Cameron Peterson, who is actually a lap down. He's on the attack Yamaha, and Peterson has plenty of pace to keep up with Josh Heron. So he's not in contention at the moment, but Cameron Peterson, Jason, do you think that Peterson's interested in unlapping himself? No, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, he's going to want to, he realizes he's not going to probably go by Heron, and Heron, 
there's two things Heron's going to be doing. He's going to be watching his pit board, and we've got these big pylons here. So he's going to see that, that Cam is not in the running for, you know, as close as he is. He's going to realize that, that he's a lap down. So uh, Heron's going to realize that Cam Peterson's a lap down. So, you know, it's just, I'm still, I'm still in a little bit of shock. I'm usually, I can usually go pretty much black or white on situations, and it's definitely a gray one there for me. I, I'm, more, I'm more disappointed, I think, Greg, at the fact that we had a tremendous race going at the front, and I was really keen to see how it was going to play itself out. And uh, now we're not going to really get that opportunity. We're talking about the incident between Josh Heron and Richie Escalante that happened moments ago out front. Where Richie Escalante ended up in the gravel trap. It's Cameron Peterson, of course, back there, like I mentioned. Jay, let's take a look again at what happened. Yeah, so if you look, he's in there really tight, and he's going to get touched here. So that's going to make it to where Heron is going to run wide, I think, Greg, on the exit here even. So, you know, ag again, I, you need to almost see a, you can see how far out Heron is, but that could also be because he got touched, and this is going to be the pit, the M4 pit. Is it the M4 no, pit? No, no, that's, that's, that, that's Heron's pit. Yeah, okay, yeah. So they're down there talking, and, you know, it's, a, it's just a bad situation that, you know, with Heron, we've seen Heron run wide in there a few times, and he did run wide a little bit on the exit there, but, and, and there's a normal line that he would normally take into that corner, so. And Escalante did see him, because in that Esc replay, we clearly saw Escalante yeah. was trying to lift. He lifted for a moment. Well, he just saw him because he knew Heron was there. Now, the thing is, is that you lift and you expect, okay, I'm gonna let this guy go through. The only thing that kind of makes me lean into Richie's favor there is because Heron still made contact with him, even though Richie stood the bike up. So again, it's one of those things where people are going to look at things. People are going to have a hundred different opinions on what's going on. Um, and, and yeah, Heron has gotten in there deep a few times, has he not? Yeah. So and it could have been the case again. So yeah, it's look, hard, what it's we a hard do one. know is that the AMA FIM North America has. There have that incident under review right now. So the incident between the one and the 54 is under review. Once we have word as to what their ruling is, we will let you know. But for now, it's the number one plate of Josh Heron who leads the way. He's got 23 seconds over Josh Hayes in fourth place. He's got another 35 seconds or another 11 seconds after Josh is Brandon Posh. Teague Hobbs, who has best finish has been sixth in the Daytona 200 and 21 in fourth place. Hayden Gillum in fifth, and Cameron Peterson, who's right behind Josh Heron, in sixth place ahead of Jeff May, Taylor Knapp, Blake Davis, Danny Eslick, Ben Young, Jason Farrell, Matt Trulove in 13th, Jason Waters up to 14th, and Richie Escalante. So Escalante is still credited with 15th place. I'm not sure if he's in the pits or circulating, but that's how much of a lead that Escalante had if he's out of this race and still in 15th place, but that'll continue to drop because we saw his dashboard as Cameron Peterson goes around oh, the outside. No. We have here. And a red flag is out, a red flag in the see. race. That's one of our M4X star Suzuki is riders. That is that gonna be Teague Hobbs? Oh man. And where is this at? Is this going into the horseshoe? Is this going into that's, the international horseshoe? Yep, that's pit lane. So these two guys. It looked like the Teague Hobbs tried to go down the inside. Is that, is it is that Jason Waters uh -huh. as well? I think it's Jason Waters, I believe. So unfortunately, riders down. Looks like Teague is up and okay. All right, so we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to get this red flag sorted out. On our timing and scoring, we have five laps to go. AMA FIM is going to have to make the decision as to what is going to happen. Is it going to be race over or are we going to continue? So we'll be back with more coverage from the Daytona 200, the 81st running in a minute. Well, I'll tell you what, what looked like it might just be a big runaway after the incident between Richie Escalani and Josh Heron. This whole dynamic has changed because we have a red flag. Now, here's the deal. You can refuel, but you shouldn't be able to change tires by what I understand in the rule. We have been watching Josh Heron punish those tires. Josh Hayes has been laying back. If he's got better tires there, 
This could get interesting. Yeah, it's been an incredibly fast race, uh, the Daytona 257 laps, but Josh Herring riding every single lap as if it was the last one. <laughs> um, talking about tyres, Roger, one thing that we were just looking at here, Cameron Peterson was circulating on track with uh, Josh Herring. He came in, they were doing a three pit stop strategy. He has fresher tyres. This could, I believe, uh, be a sprint race. Peterson with fresher tyres, he could now be in a position to win this thing. Well, yeah, definitely can't be a, a tire change. I actually asked the other day before the weekend if, if they could change tires, and they can. And I think even with the draft, even if he has better tires, it, it's not like a track. It's different because of the, the draft. It's going to keep everybody together. He might be able to get a better run getting out of the uh, chicane onto the banking, but I don't think uh, tires will play a huge part of it. But it's going to be an interesting five laps if they go back. Yeah, we just want to talk a little bit, if we can, uh, Greg, uh, about that incident. Obviously, there is an incident that was under review between Josh Herrin and Richie Escalante. It's still under review. We do not know. Now, you're a wiser man than me. If they restart this race, what happens to any penalty, if there was a penalty, to Josh Herrin? I mean, we don't know if there is. I'm just speculating. Yeah. But again, these are all questions that people are going to be asking around the world. Let's have a look at what happened, uh, Roger, as this uh, unfolds. Riders now coming back down into the pits. Josh Herring and Richie Escalante, they were going at it down into turn one. Bikes being refueled. Here we go then, down into turn one. There's a gap there, he goes for it, they make contact. Down goes Escalante. Incident still under review. It's a tough one to call. It's, it's a tough one to call. I mean, it was definitely aggressive riding, but you know, you just never know. You know, it, it was aggressive. And they both, they were starting to get aggressive with, yep. with the, each other as the race went on. And I'm sure Richie Escalante is, uh, distraught as I would be as well. He had an amazing chance to win that race, but you know, things happen and that's that's racing and they're gonna review it and yep. they're gonna have more camera angles than we have and I get to see more about it. And it's interesting to me because it's it, it looked to me like we were getting to that stage like we did before that second pit stop where Heron with his aggressive style had used that tire up more and I think Richie was gonna go and I wonder if Josh said, I wanna be in the front and made that commitment and that's a classic move down into turn one because you turn in and then you could float it out and make the corner and if he just released the brake for a second that's how you get that little squirt you know down to the inside uh interestingly t gobs had been hustling and had worked his way up into fourth and uh, hayden gillum has had a great comeback drive but watch it right here you can see that's the question is richie's turning in and he sees him and he tries to raise up a little bit but hot Josh, at that point, was in front. So that's yeah. a tough one to judge. It's at the last really minute, is. isn't it? He goes down and, yep. uh, oh, it's a tough one. And again, Roger, I, I don't know the rule book for endurance racing, but if there is a penalty applied by race direction, again, we don't know if there will right. be, but if there is, does that penalty apply to a restart? Because my understanding is that if we do restart, it's a five-lap sprint. We start from where they finished. It would be a fresh race, it would be a, it? I would, That's I how think I so. I know it. the rules are just slightly different because mm. it is the, the 200 right. and, and different stuff, so I'm not sure exactly how they're going to add that. But, uh, I mean, even look, look, what about Brandon Posh? Is he back in it? He had that speeding penalty. Yeah, and I believe uh, Hannah Loper is down there. Uh, she probably has got eyes and is uh, in places that we haven't. Hannah, what can you tell us down there? Karen's. Josh Aaron is cooling off here. Just going to grab a quick word with him. Josh, what can you tell me about the incident with you and Richie Escalante getting together out there? I was just lining that pass up the entire race. I knew there was about 10, 15 laps to go. Just tried seeing if I could do it because I knew that it would fluster him at the end of the race if I could get in under there because he was leaving an opening. Uh, I, had, I had the pass, and he stayed leaned over. That's, that's what I, I saw out of it. You know, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just trying my hardest out there to get up with the game plan because the guy's got about 15 horsepower on me, it seems like. So just trying to figure out any pass I could possibly do for the last lap. And, and uh, yeah. Josh Heron looking for a way through. Thanks, uh, Hannah and Greg. Well, uh, you look at this angle. He is, a, I mean, he hit, it's the back tire. He is in front. He is in front. A, a yeah, he bit. is technically in front. Um, yeah. There's no different. arguing that he's in front. You know, that isn't it. You know, I, I think what, uh, what they'd be looking at is the angle as Richie was turning in when Josh came through and uh, it ran wide. So, uh, yeah, this is a tough one. I mean, it could be a racing incident or, you know, they could judge it uh, either way. But the interesting thing to me at this point now is let's assume Josh doesn't get a penalty for it, right? Right, absolutely. Um, Joshua Hayes and 
Teague Hobbs, uh, if he can get his bike back, uh, but Hayden Gillum, certainly, they're all still up on that lead lap. Brandon Posh is too, but that penalty said it would be assessed after the race. So to me, there's no way Brandon can win this race unless he can somehow drive away from these guys by 15 seconds in five laps. I don't see that happening. So to me, it's looking like it's a Heron Hayes. And uh, if, if Hobbs can get back into the pits, uh, Hobbs and Gillum battle at this stage because everybody else is down a lap. Ah, oh, that's a good point. Yeah, Cam Pitt. Uh, but it, they, it, they wouldn't add the times together. It wouldn't be an aggregate race. It would be a fresh restart. You know, yeah, we were talking about But if Cam somebody goes down a lap, you just give everybody a lap or two or three back? We were talking about you know Cam Peterson, if he was going to pass Josh Heron or not. Yeah. You know, Ben sitting behind him. If he would have maybe passed him, mm. he would might be on the lead lap. Yes, well, he did. unlapped himself. He did but pass him. He did pass him. But a but complete did lap. Oh, but it's got to go back. Long. That's a good point. That's, yeah, when that that's going to come down to when that red flag came out. Yes. Yeah, exactly. 100%. So, yeah, race, there's a lot, of, a lot of things that we don't know. This is not over by a long this is shot. Very, this is very dynamic right now. Yeah. It's uh, an interesting situation. Josh there took it to Melissa. And, uh, <laughs> I love the language you're racing, don't you? The sign language you're racing. Yeah. It's so fun to watch. But, uh, you know, this could come right back uh, to Josh right now. And my only reason I'm saying that is because of the tires. You can't change tires on a red. And you could refuel and that kind of thing. But I really think Heron's tires. You know, Josh was back there. Why would he push super hard by himself when he knows he couldn't find them? So I think he, I his think tires it, could be in really yeah, good shape. You're, you're possibly right. It does bring Josh Hayes back into it. I'm trying to remember, didn't we have a sprint race a couple grid. of years ago when the, in the restart? And it is just like a fresh race, isn't it's it? A, it's, it's a fresh, a fresh race. race. So anybody on the on the, the lap can still can still fight, yeah, I believe. Any, if Brandon Posh gets his time back, any guys in the top five can win this race. Right. They all yeah. have an, an equal shot, in my opinion. If Cam Peterson, if he, whenever they figure it out, if he gets his lap back, um, I because I'm not sure how far they got to go with so many riders to yeah. go back to the last completed lap. Yep. Anybody on the lead lap on this next restart is going to have a chance to win this. Yes, absolutely. And here's the thing. If they give Cameron that lap back, if he did get around and, and they hang on to it, he'll have by far and away the fresher tires because he made that very late third pit stop. But let's take a look at some highlights here, Roger. And there was the launch. Josh Heron from pole uh, doing what he wanted to do from the get-go, getting out front. Danny Esla coming after him, but a huge moment back there by Cam Peterson. And it, it from that point, it's been a bit of a problematic race for him as of late. Then this moment from one of the guys we really thought could be one of the uh, win contenders. Yeah, PJ had an accident. Cam Peterson had issues as well. And then toward the end of the race, it was coming down to these two. See, Josh Heron made a little mistake there getting into the first horseshoe. And, uh, you know, seven or eight, eight laps left. These guys were really starting to go at it, trying to figure out where they wanted to be. And uh, then, you know, I think Heron wants to lead. I think they both feel really good about their chances in front. I do, too. I do, too. We were talking a little bit as well. They've both been racing so hard. This whole race has been at a ridiculously fast pace up front. How about fuel? Are they going to be good on fuel to the end? Well, well that's going to be yeah, interesting, too. Yeah. You can refuel there. The, now the, you're good. Yeah. You bet. But you're I mean, right. There, there, we were wondering about that. There it is. And this is when the race changed. Yeah. And again, it's all about, I mean, this is so tough to judge. So tough to judge. So that's why we just leave it to the officials. They'll make their own call on it. And here's another look at it. And there is a look. Richie obviously mighty upset at this stage. And a bit of a discussion down there in the Ducati pit as well. Now, here's the one that caused the uh, the big wreck, and it was the 92 of Jason Waters and an absolutely flying Teague Hobbs. And the question is, how's Hobbs' bike? Was he able to get up back on it, get it back into pit lane? Uh, because, you know, I mean, he was coming, he was coming fast, and he's on that lead lap. Yeah, if he was in that... He would have had a chance to win this if he can get back into the race. But it looked like those bikes went flying pretty good. So yeah. if Teague can... Uh, get back in it hopefully he can this has been a tremendous I effort so. for teague hobbs for his first daytona 200 with all the pit stops and, and and all the laps and have himself in the fourth place if he gets to make the restart i mean that's impressive yeah. what he's done today really it really really is uh and again you know to me uh the two big questions are one is cameron peterson did the he did pass josh heron uh but did the 
red flag come out so they'd have to go back to the previous lap. That's going to be one big story because he's got by far and away the freshest tires. Secondly, uh, the other story is Brandon Posh. Um, what's going to happen with that 15-second penalty? They said it would be assessed at the end of the race. So he is still going to get the penalty. We just got confirmation. Mike went, uh, Michael went in, checked with race control. So apparently, uh, like I said, unless Brandon runs out uh, and gets to a 16-second lead somehow in these last five laps, there's, it's going to be really difficult for him to be able to, uh, to bring this win home. The other story, as I said, Cameron Peterson, if they give him that lap, if they say, yeah, you got your lap back, he's got really, really good tires on that bike. So... Interesting things here. As they say, things are getting curiouser and curiouser. Yeah, I just stepped away to uh, have a look in uh, race direction, and uh, I was only allowed so far into the room, <laughs> as I'm sure you can imagine. There's a hive of activity uh, going on down there. But I did just clarify the situation with regards to the penalty, uh, the speeding penalty okay. that obviously would apply to Brandon Pash, uh, and it was explained to me uh, and showed to me on the rule book uh, how it works out. So uh, all of the riders that received a penalty for speeding, that penalty will still be applied at the end of this uh, restart. However, it is a fresh race. It is a literally a dash to the line and that is it that's how it will be determined so whoever crosses the line first is the winner and unless you uh, have a penalty clearly. even if even if you're down a lap or more that's how i just understood it oh my now I may, I may have misunderstood it but like i said there were so many people going down there i, yeah, kinda, yeah, yeah. I left sharpish I, i've had enough skirmishes for the last <laughs> week so <laughs> yeah i left but uh, yeah the, the, certainly as far as brandon pash is concerned he will still get the penalty uh, obviously you can see a lot of work now going on down here is that's that Teague's bike yeah richie's bike Oh, and that's another question. Yeah, I'm not sure. Would, does that mean that Escalante can restart? I, I could. It depends how many yeah, laps. He went, uh, he went down for a, a long maybe time ago, fairing, but maybe, maybe yeah. they turn this fair and we can see yeah, which. I, but I guess it depends how many laps they go back. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, it's, well, well, we promised you that the Daytona 200, the 81st running of this great event, was going to be uh, exciting, and uh, we didn't lie. It, we we, it we kept it real. It looks like a se the one fairing looks like a 79, the guys. Holding uh, right that there. would be yeah. Teague. And that would make sense because he went down literally and then the flag came out, so yeah. he would be allowed yeah. to restart. But maybe that was just the spare. He might just have his number yeah. on. So we'll, we'll see. That's a good point. But if, you know, if it is a complete reset where, you know, if, you know, even if you're down three laps, it's a brand new race. Um, Cameron Peterson, I think, he has a, a shot here going right to the front and just saying goodbye. Yeah, his tires, of, yeah, because he has a late fresh stop. Tire. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's kind of what I was saying. But I get your point that, like, is it or do you still stay a lap behind? But, I <laughs> yeah. mean, it's all these new rules. But, uh Whatever happens, uh, Roger, it is going to be exciting. Uh, they did confirm this will be restarted. There will be a restart. We don't know yet how many laps. Um, we don't know how they're going to be gridded up. There's um, PJ Jacobson. Again, potentially now a chance for him if it's a complete restart. Yeah, if it's a complete, if it's a complete restart, complete yeah. restart and, and, and what happens, I mean, yeah. I mean, regardless, it's going to be an exciting race. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to have three or four guys and with the chance to win this and just going all out. You see them trying to get this bike back ready. It looks like they have a chance. It looks like, uh, you know, it's not too far from, from being ready to go. We did see, obviously, those riders that went down. They were up on their feet. So T Cobb's getting the bike back, and uh, he'll be ready to go. Fuel going in. Let's have a look, then. If you are just joining us, this is uh, live coverage of the 81st running of the Daytona 200. Josh Herring went for the gap. They made contact. He... Uh, Fortunate Richie Escalante, as you can see, he was in front, but I guess the question is, would Escalante have made oh, I don't know. It's it's a hard one. It's a real uh, hard one. Yeah. You know what they oh, what they call that? Above our pay grade. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. To make that decision at this stage, obviously. That's a really close one. You can yeah. tell how Richie feels, no question, but that's hardly a surprise. Um, I mean, he hadn't really put a wheel wrong, had he? He no. was riding a perfect race. No, he had. Great weekend. And that's the incident that brought out the red flag. And uh, a couple of riders making contact. Yeah, that guy's center screen was Teague Hobbs yeah. uh, bouncing around there. And uh, again, you know, the question is, if, if is it you're involved in a red flag causing incident or did you cause it? Because we don't know. Was it Teague coming up underneath the 92 or, or of, uh, of uh, Jason Waters or was it something else, to, you know, that, you know, we don't know. So that's just something that's that's uh, going to be interesting here. But this crew, they're sure acting like he's got a shot at this still. And he yeah. was flying at the end. Yeah, absolutely. Now, obviously, they're repairing the Vision Wheel M4 X-Star Suzuki. And uh, you see the, the little hammers giving it a little tap. Because you can't start replacing parts. This is an endurance race. Exactly. So they've got to try and fix what they've got. But a very experienced team. Chris Ulrich runs a, a very, very slick operation. Uh, the, the M4, the Team Hammer squad down there, uh, Roger. 
Oh, yeah, they had a gr I mean, they've always had a great team, got a great crew, and even bring in more guys for this race because they know how important it is. And, uh, you know, they've won a ton of endurance races for, for years. And they won that pit stop challenge, so you know that they, uh, that they execute well uh, and that, uh, you know, is important on top of it at this stage. You know, and we talked about tires earlier, about some people having fresher than others. The heat cycle. Yeah. Some tires heat cycle better than others. You have different brands. Yeah. Uh, some riders don't respond to that t heat cycle in the tire very well because it gives them a different feeling. So uh, that could come into play as well. A heat cycle m slightly hardens a tire, right? So you don't get quite the grip, but you get a little bit more durability out and, of it. And sometimes if you, you don't, don't hurt it, it. Sometimes you don't notice it, but there's other times where you'll, you'll it, it's a big change. Okay. And uh, so we'll see. Maybe not, but I know previously it has happened. There is Teague Hobbs. He's made it uh, back. New helmet going on. We're being informed that there are just three minutes to go until the pit lane will open. We still don't know how many laps we're going to run for, but uh, we'll bring you that as soon as we can along with the grid. But Teague Hobbs, I'm glad to see him up on his feet and even, uh, even happier to see him have another shot, shot at this because he was not a million miles away no. from the podium there. So uh, he now gets another bite of the cherry. And as you said, uh, Roger, whatever is about to happen when these lights go out, this is going to be exciting. Oh, it's going to be cr it's going to be crazy. I mean, they're going to be going at it like you haven't seen before. And I think Teague, these guys are going to be going at it so hard, the pace might not be very fast. And I think Teague has showed incredible pace this week. But that was a big crash. You've seen him mm -hmm. go go flipping. Yeah, yeah. You know, is he, is he healthy enough? Is it going to, you know, bother him the first couple laps of the race or not? Well, when he's not talking and when, you know, I've seen him a couple of times kind of give that thing like, wow, this, this smarts. So we're going to be watching that. But here's the interesting thing to me. They've gone for 52 laps racing sometimes underneath – the speed that Josh Heron set for pole. Yeah. They have gone at it incredibly hard. Now they're going to ramp it up even more for these last five laps or whatever they decide here. It's going to be insanity. Yeah. And everybody's back together. Yeah, and we heard from Josh Heron down there when Hannah was speaking to, uh, to him. His plan was to try and ruffle Escalante in those final few laps, try and get him to make a mistake, try and get him out of his rhythm. And yep. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the pace of this race has been insane. I mean, we knew it would be a fast race, so we knew, obviously, based on the weather conditions, that it would be a fast race. But, Roger, for these guys to be going quicker than, uh, than qualifying and consistently quicker than qual qualifying, pretty impressive stuff. Yeah, it's been, a, it's been one of the fastest paces, I think, probably ever for the for the 200s it's just been crazy how fast those guys all in the 48s man i mean I even when they get in traffic they're still doing 49 so it's been really quick and that just shows you the competition that's just how stout it is this year and uh, i think it's going to continue to be like that yeah i mean josh heron's best lap in this race a 148.2 compared to a 148.7 in qualifying again it's cooler by a good 10 to 15 degrees today and that plays into it obviously uh, but still, it was just a relentless pace. And uh, you could say, I mean, you know, Josh pretty much threw down the gaunt, you know, the gauntlet, didn't he? He just took off. And he, anytime he'd lose a ground, he'd just fight, bring it back, and slice through people and say, come get me. Uh, so he was delivering the message, if you're going to beat me, it isn't going to come easy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can't beat a bit of duct tape. There we go. Stick it all back together, uh, and away we go. So uh, yeah. In the old days, it was, it, it was duct tape and bailing wire. <laughs> You know, to keep a, a bike racing. And uh, we think we're going to have car, our bikes heading back out uh, for their lap here. And right now, actually, the green flag flies. Yes, yeah, so the green flag is uh, waved. Riders now are allowed to come back onto the circuit. Uh, this is the sighting lap. It will be a quick start procedure, Roger. Just explain that to us. Well, they want, you know, earlier before the race, they just had a, the, you know, a long grid. Yeah. So yep. now that they'll, they'll come around one lap, somebody will be standing on their grid spot. They will stop. The mechanics will will walk off, and then they'll do their their warm up lap. So okay. it's not going to be a, uh, not going to be a long procedure. And I'm assuming, again, maths was never my strong point, but there were, they've done 52 laps. It's a 57 lap race. You would it's think a, it would, five lap it'd be a five-lap sprint you until assume. we hear otherwise. It says five laps yeah, to go. Yeah, five laps yeah. to go. There it is. It comes up on the board now. But then again, coming back to your point, just to confuse things, <laughs> if it is a five-lap sprint, then how is Peterson and those guys back in the mix if it's a fresh race? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. 
Well, that'll be the first thing we're going to be looking at is when it goes green, what happens to those lap counts? That's going to be the first thing that's going to kind of give us a little bit of a of a clue here. Yeah, and also uh, we still don't know what decision race direction have made uh, with regards to Josh Herring. Is there going to be a penalty? You would like to think that before the lights go out for this restart, if there is going to be a penalty, he needs to know what the penalty is. He can't go racing and then win and then be given a penalty after the race. Yeah, yeah you don't it, want to have to do a, a podium and then yeah, yeah the you know, he needs to know. Win or so, decided later. Yeah. And again, the other question, uh, you know, for Brandon Posh is, is uh, you know, if if they assess that 15 second at the end, uh, it's going to be really, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, really it's, difficult for him to be able to to uh, you know pull off even a top five here at this stage. So uh, well, yeah, in a, in a, in, if it is just a fresh restart in five laps, you're not going to pull away and win by 15 seconds, are no, you? No, it's it, impossible, yeah, so. absolutely impossible. So it's too bad that one couldn't have been like you know at his second pit stop hold him for 15 seconds yeah. after they're ready to go so then he could get back in and race because that would have brought him right into this yeah. at that stage then everybody compresses back so so the riders come back down there on the left hand side is josh heron on the right hand side of the picture is the number four of josh hayes 96 brandon pash the two-time and defending champion here in daytona we see the 99 of jeff may May was running really well there, wasn't mm -hmm. he? Up into the top, uh, into the top seven. A lot of experience, Jeff May. Lots of experience. And, uh, you, know, you know, let's not forget Hayden Gillum. We've been talking yeah. about some of the other guys, but he was throwing down some pretty solid laps there he, as well. He so. was making up a lot of ground yeah. by himself. You bet he was. So, all right, here we go. And uh, we're getting ready. Stage is set for this five-lap sprint to the end. Let's go back to the MAV-TV booth with Greg White and Jason Pridmore. Welcome back to the Daytona 200 at the World Center of Racing here in Daytona Beach, Florida. After red flag conditions, we have sorted everything out. And Jason Pridmore, here's a look at the incident that caused the red flag. Yeah, it looks like T. Cobbs got into the side of Jason Waters. We saw a great shot of these two guys talking to each other afterwards. It looked like T went up and made sure that Jason was okay. And uh, they were able to get T. Cobbs back bike back to the pits and repaired. So he's on the front row. Now there were five laps left, but AMAFAM has added five laps to the race. So Hannah is with Scott Padgett, who is the chief steward for Moto America to explain. Hannah? I'm with Scott Padgett, chief grid steward for Moto America. Scott, take us through this restart procedure. Okay, the rule stated that to have a complete race, we would have to have run 53 laps. The red, lap, the red flag came out on lap 52, therefore we're gonna have a restart. It's gonna be a 10 lap restart per race direction. That restart will be based on the grid, will be based on the final, the last completed lap. And we're gonna have a quick start procedure uh, here, hopefully shortly in about five minutes. All right, thank you, Scott. All right, so when we went to break, Josh Heron was leading over Josh Hayes and Brandon Posh. Teague Hobbs had hit the deck in fourth place. Hayden Gillum in fifth and Cameron Peterson in sixth. That would be our first two rows. However, Jason Pridmore, <laughs> During the red flag, race direction made a call that with the incident between Josh Heron and Richie Escalante earlier in the race a few laps ago, where Heron and Escalante collided, crashing Escalante out of the race, Heron's been penalized six grid positions. So now Josh Hayes is going to start from the number one spot or pole position. Brandon Posh and Teague Hobbs will be on the front row with him. Hayden Gillum, Cameron Peterson, and I believe Josh Heron will be in that, in that sixth spot. 
I think Heron's on, uh, I saw him gridded up seven. Seven, okay, yeah. so Jeff May then yeah. moves to row number two on the 99. It's a 10 lap race. The chances of really that grid position penalizing Josh Heron in terms of his finishing result is probably pretty slim. However, there is something to note is that there is no tire changes allowed during the red flag. So whatever tires they had underneath them, this is going to be very interesting to see who stays out with the tires they have on or are people going to stay out for a couple laps, try to come in and get tires. It's, it's all going to be depending on what the leader does. Josh Hayes. Yeah, I don't think anybody's going to come in in 10 laps. Obviously, they're going to be hammered down, even if the tire's a little bit used. And, uh, you know, T. Hobbs on that front row, well done from that team with all they were dealing with in probably the last 20, 20 minutes or so, 30 minutes. The fact that he's on that front row, this gives this kid a real shot. Josh Hayes was 23 and a half seconds back, so this gives the number four the possibility of winning this race again. Revs are up. The red light's on, it's off. So here we go, the restart for the Daytona 200, the 81st running, and it looks like Brandon Posh is gonna lead us into turn number one. Teague Hobbs in second spot, Josh Hayes in third, and a couple of Disrupt Racing motorcycles right back there in fourth and fifth. Yeah, that would be, is it, is, uh, I'm trying to think who the two, I know it's Hayden Gillum. May. And it's Jeff May, that's exactly right. Yeah, so you see these guys getting into the International Horseshoe, Posh over Hayes right now, I believe Gillum just kind of forced his way or in, into that third spot. So they're headed down into the fast kink. I'm looking, Heron's back there in sixth at the moment. It's not gonna take him anything to be able to run up to catch up to these guys in front as he goes around the outside of Jeff May into that second horseshoe. So we already had 52 laps complete, as you heard earlier. And now it looks like we're gonna go to 62. So for the first time in this restart, Brandon Posh leads us onto the banking. Josh Hayes trying to get a drive to get in the draft of that Triumph Triple. And we'll see if that R6 got some legs. And the fact that there's five guys still on the lead lap, those are the five that we've got to kind of look at. Heron, Hayes, Posh, Teague Hobbs, and Hayden Gillum are the five. And you can see here, there's Heron there as he's going to probably get himself slotted into second or third as they go into the chicane. He does, so he's right here behind Posh. T. Hobbs gets shuffled back to third. Hayes all the way back to fifth now. So T. Hobbs now getting a taste of what it's like to run up front with this group on that Vision Wheel M4 X-Star Suzuki. There should be no, the good thing is there should be no traffic, Greg, for 10 laps of this race. This guy should have a clean run all the way to that checkered flag. So uh, T. Hobbs goes to the front of the Daytona 200. Over Heron, Posh just behind Hayden Gillum. Heron's gonna try to go down the outside as they go down into turn one and make that pass, and he does. And now he's gonna try to put his head down through this infield section. You can see Camp Peterson there as well now. So Heron goes from that grid penalty out front. Teague Hobbs doing a great job, he's not really bottlenecking anybody up. It's Cameron Peterson he's, looking over his shoulder. He's in kind of a weird spot, is Cam, because he wants to go to the front and get up there, but he realizes he's a lap down and he doesn't want to be part of, of messing up the guys who are trying to race for the win. And uh, you can see he, he had some pace there. He wanted to go up the inside of Hayes and try to give Josh enough room to cut back down on him in that horseshoe spot. So... But right now, Heron... He's in the spot that he needs to be in, wants to be in, and now that it's up to these two GSX-R 750s to try to run him back down on the banking. Up high they go. Now we're gonna see who's got the draft and pass. You can see it looks like a move's being made for fifth spot in the right part of your screen. And now for third. So Posh, who had early pace on that first lap, the one thing we don't know, Jason, and this is really mm -hmm. the unknown at this point with the amount of laps we have remaining in this race, is who's got the tires underneath them. That's right. Because what did you do during that whole stint? Even if you were by yourself, were you abusing those tires? And how did it heat cycle? No, that's exactly right. And you can see even Brandon's bike, I can see it just moving around ever so slightly on the banking right now and looking to see if Hayes can draft Camp Peterson and, and Hayden Gillum. And it doesn't look like he really could there. And you can see Cam's got Cam's got a bike underneath him right now. He wants to go and challenge up at the front right now with these guys. He's, you see Heron and Cam Peterson are both going to try to go around the outside. Oh. We have another faller. Looks like number 103. Yeah, that's Arango. That's Arango. 
who had, had a good run at it. Top Pro Motorsports racer was up to 18th and unfortunately got to be out of it. We saw him earlier in the race with a good, fast motorcycle. That's the second part of the chicane again. That's where we saw Hayden Gillum. And man, what kind of job did Hayden Gillum do to get his bike back up, stay on the lead lap earlier when we saw him tip over? Unbelievable. Yeah, really good. So Cameron Peterson, one more position, and he will unlap himself. That's the 45 we're talking about on the blue and yellow motorcycle. That attack performance, R6. We'll see him in the Medallion Superbike class for Moto America as a regular this year. And keep in mind, we saw Cam come into the pits for that third time, so he's got some fresher tires underneath him for sure That's than true. the guys in front. So, and I'm sure everybody knows where everybody is. And if, if Heron sees Cam Peterson go by him, it's not going to bother him too much other than it's, it's a deal where if Cam gets out in front now, let's see what happens here. I'm, I'm curious to see if, if Heron tries to outbreak him going down into the chicane or if Cam even tries to outbreak Heron into the chicane. I do like the fact that I'm seeing that the, the group is starting to like be able to stay together a little bit. Hayes has got himself back in, almost like back in sixth spot moving himself forward. We haven't really been able to see Hayden Gillum move himself forward at all, have we? No, like, we haven't. You know, like, He's also probably, size-wise, the largest competitor, yeah. I would think, in this group. I mean, Brandon Posh, really tall. Tall, yeah. As well as Hayden Gillum. But Gillum, who's got a lot of racing ahead of him, carries a little bit more weight than Posh does. Wow. Look at Teague Hobbs and Hayden Gillum there as they get the big... And Jeff May as well. I love seeing it. Jeff May running up in that lead group as well. Cam Peterson going up the inside as Heron goes wide again. So now Cameron Peterson, who is a lap down, he unlapped himself. So the leader of the race is still the number one of Heron and number four Hayes is in second spot with Brandon Posh on the TOBC Triumph. He's in third. For anybody thinking about it or asking, you know, you got to remember, Greg, if this race was to get red flagged again, Cam Peterson would get himself back kind of on that lead lap. So it's still very important that this guy gets himself to the front of this pack and tries to lead across the line to try to get himself back on that lead lap just in case we had another incident happen and uh, it would put him back on that lead lap for any kind of restarts. And also, Tire Wars back at it where it looked like Dunlop may have had this race in the books. And now with Brandon Posh in the mix and Jeff May back there as well, running those Pirelli tires. You can see Cameron Peterson starting to try to pull away from everybody. He doesn't really want to be roughed up. He's just trying to run his own pace. I think, Jason, it's a better plan for Cameron Peterson if he was able to. Now you see Heron's going to try to go up underneath him here. And he does. He makes that pass, gets back by. And we know when this race started, when this restart started, we showed five guys on that lead lap. So right now on our screens, we're showing Cam Peterson in second, but I believe he's a lap down. Yeah, he was definitely a lap down when, when, when we had the timing of scoring on the red flag, unless they reverted back to the last lap. Yeah, it's not, it still wouldn't make any, any, any difference there uh, in that particular situation. So yeah. here we go, Greg. What do we got? Six to go now. Six to go. The number one, Josh Heron. Takes the spot, Josh Hayes on the number four, trying to find some room, that was awfully close. Cameron Peterson looking for an inch up the inside, has a look over his shoulder, and sees a whole lot. Oh, Josh Heron with his foot off the peg. Not sure what that was about. Boy, they are so tight right now. So five and a half laps to go. Josh Heron leads the way. We know that he is in the number one spot. He's on the lead lap, as is Josh Heron. Our timing and scoring shows Cameron Peterson in second spot. It looks like that on our screens, but Jay, we're pretty sure Look that he the, was a lap down. See the grip he's got? He's got so much grip on the exit, does Cam Peterson, that he can almost run by these guys. He's got a little bit of chatter I can see there going into turn six, but uh, he's, he's, he's able to turn the bike back underneath guys in the middle of the corners just because of those fresher tires that he's got on because of the late pit stop that he had to do. So that's why you can see the pace that he has at the moment. Now let's see if Hayes can get in the double bike draft. Posh is trying, you can see Posh's bike moving around again, even coming off that bank. And you can see it just wallowing around ever so slightly. So Jason, we're being informed that because of the way the situation worked itself out without going into too many technical details, the position is the position. So Cameron Peterson is leading this race. So what we see on our timing and scoring is 
Correct. Got it. So Cameron Peterson with the possibility of winning the Daytona 200, as is anybody else. So it's Cameron Peterson down at the bottom. Josh Heron up top. Brandon Posh on the Triumph, trying to go for the three-peat. It's Ducati versus Triumph versus Suzuki versus Yamaha. Dunlop versus Pirelli with five laps to go in the Daytona 200, the extended race after a 52-lap red flag. So Hayden Gillum now gets himself up to that spot where we kind of were expecting to see him get up there sooner. Hayden Gillum will not be afraid to get the elbows out either, as we know, and uh, puts himself solidly in that second spot as Hayes is getting shuffled back here a little bit. Not sure what happened there, Greg, but uh, Josh gets shuffled back to probably back to seventh. You can see there's four riders now kind of going to the front here. Hayden Gillum looking down, gets down the inside of, of Heron as Heron ran a little bit wide in that fast kink. And now Hayden Gillum leads the Daytona 200 for his first time. Incredible. We've seen Teague Hobbs lead. Hayden Gillum lead. Brandon Posh, Josh Hayes, Cameron Peterson, Josh Heron, PJ Jacobson has been in the lead at one point. Now we got four guys. Danny Eslick. We have a we have a serious breakaway though. Now these four guys here look like they're trying to pull away and get away from that the rest of that battle. And uh, just like last year, we had four riders at the front. We've got four more again for the 81st running here. So the guys behind are going to do everything they can to try to catch back up. T. Cobb's trying to pull them along. Looks like he's done a good job. Hayes again tight on the exit there and is able to pull onto the back of Hobbs. But now he's going to need that bike in front of him to pull him up to those other four bikes. When they come by this time, Greg, it'll be four to go. Going down low is Cameron Peterson. Ooh, look at the aggressive move across the banking for the 95. Disrupt Racing's Hayden Gillum. There goes Heron. Nice draft and pass maneuver. Yeah, they're all back together again. So that four rider breakaway didn't last for long. The bankings here at Daytona allow us to keep the racing as close as you like. And I think that that's what you saw. Teague Hobbs pulled Josh Hayes all the way back up to this group. And now Hayes starts to go to work. He looks like he's on the outside of Brandon Posh. Posh. As we saw last year again, Greg, he was so comfortable being in a position. As he goes over, gives Hayes a little bit of a thumbs up, gave him a little bit of room there. Hayden Gillum on that GSXR 750. Suzuki leads the way over the Yamaha R6, a 600cc machine. Cameron Peterson attack performance Yamaha. And there's Heron on the number one. And on his V2, Ducati. And let's give 22 Blake Davis a call out. What a great job to see him, our Twins Cup champ up there in this battle with these guys. He just ran a 50.7, so he's running the same exact laps, obviously, as these guys, because he's in this mix. So the 22 of Blake Davis doing a great job right now, getting this experience around all these guys that he's probably been watching race for the last couple years in some of the bigger classes. Blake Davis is getting to go to school here a little bit and see what it's like to run up front with all of them. Draft and pass into the chicane. To the point goes the 45 of Cameron Peterson. On the revenge tour, looking for victory after losing it by seven thousandths of a second in his first run at the Daytona 200 last year. But Hayden Gillum, who still has to race another race after this one, Mission King of the Baggers, getting after it right now out front, and he's actually looking comfortable leading this race. But look at how many riders are behind with the possibility of winning this thing. Eight riders all in the fray, four wide on the banking. With three laps to go, it's time to start formulating your plan. And it'll be Cameron Peterson taking us through turn number one. Josh Hayes back there in four spot, just behind Josh Heron. So Cameron Peterson on the 45. Hayden Gillum on the 95. Josh oh. Heron in the number one. Hits Josh they got, Hayes. They got close. Just they a got little close up tap. In there, yeah. No harm, no foul. Brandon Posh hanging back in fifth. We've seen Posh do this last year. The question is, does he have the pace? Who's got the tires after the red flag? Coming up on two and a half laps to go. Blake Davis on the 22, hanging back there. P.J. Jacobson on the 66. He could come up from nowhere. He's on the back of that group. Jeff May as well. 
Aaron struggling for that rear grip onto the banking. But when that Ducati goes to full sail, we know it's got plenty of grunt. But look at the gap. Cameron Peterson is wow. putting on the field at the moment. Jason, you talked about it. He came in with a late pit stop because of his problems early on in the race. And we've got to speculate that Cameron Peterson has the freshest tires in the field. He does. No question about it. He's got fresher tires. I think he was only out there for maybe five laps, six laps on those tires where everybody else had been out there on a full run almost. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's going to pay off. And you can see now Hayden Gillum doing his best. He's going to run him back down. Posh and Heron side by side. Hayes in the draft of those two behind. And they're going by. Oof. Wow, that's a big speed difference, isn't it? Coming across the stripe, it was Hayden Gillum who leads him with two laps to go. Josh Heron trying to go around the outside. Cameron Peterson, he pushes wide. He's going to lose a couple of positions, and he took Brandon Posh with him. Blake Davis is up to third. Oh, Blake, Blake Davis. Blake Davis is up to third. Love seeing it. The biothermal, biothermal Blake Davis Racing entry out of Lynchburg, Virginia. Blake Davis, the number 22. He's racing with some of the best in the world. What a great job. Lap and a half to go in this extended Daytona 200. An affair that's scheduled to go now, 62 laps. Five extra from the 57. On a restart race, the last 10 laps. It's Hayden Gillum who leads the way, the number 95. Out of Owensboro, Kentucky on the Disrupt Racing Suzuki GSXR 750. Part of the next generation motorcycles, the old school Yamaha R6, the tried and true, the reference for torque for all the bikes in the next generation category, the Yamaha R6 prepared by attack performance. Oh, Blake Davis with a big drive down the back, gets behind both these guys, double drafts, gonna put him in the second as they get into the chicane. Now he's gonna see if he can draft past that attack R6 up in front of him. Cam Peterson wheelies, he knows he's coming to the white flag this time by, he has a look over his shoulder, sees he's pulled a small back gap. Now you've got him queuing up three wide, that's gonna help Heron as he's gonna get the draft, take that Ducati down to the bottom. It might be a little soon for Heron to do that only because let's see if these other guys can pull back up on that Ducati. Hayes now showing some speed as he's going to get down towards the apron. White flag flies. Here we go, the final lap of the Daytona 200. Brandon Posh is right there as well. The two-time winner. Josh Heron hasn't won it since 2010. Hayes has never won it. Blake Davis, are you kidding me? I love it. So great seeing him doing this. And Hayden Gillum also. And there's probably some guy. Oh, Cam got in there deep. You can see he was doing everything he could to get that bike stopped. You saw that. R6 chattering just in front. He was trying to stay off the back of Hayes. Everybody is trying to lock themselves into a position, Greg, that's going to put them in the most advantageous spot on that run as Hayes looks to go down the inside of Camp Peterson for the second horseshoe. Doesn't make it. Look who's coming. Fourth place, Brandon Posh slides up the inside of Blake Davis, and he's put himself in the exact same spot that he was in this time last year. The chicane is going to make the difference. Josh Heron has not been the strongest rider through the chicane all race long. Can he nail it? Look who's going up the inside. It's Josh Hayes as he drives onto the banking. Herring spinning up onto the edge of the banking. So it's now Josh Hayes who leads the way. They're going to sail us off into the chicane. Who's going to have the late breaking and wants to lead out of the chicane? They're going five wide. Blake Davis down at the bottom. Here goes Josh Hayes. Now they're going to sit up and break for the chicane. Who's going to want to take the spot? Josh, Josh Heron. Josh Hayes feels like he has to lead from the front. He's going to try to get through the chicane. Look at the gap. Ooh. Look at that gap. And, ha and Heron, Heron lost the front. A little bit loose. Heron lost the front. So Josh Hayes now with a big gap. Is it going to be enough? I don't think so. Because here comes three very fast motorcycles behind him. But Hayes is starting to hold him off. We don't see any big moves happening in the back. But they're trying to time it perfectly. The checkered flag awaits. Josh Hayes has nothing but daylight in front of him. Has he done enough? Here comes Josh Heron around the inside. And on the outside goes Brandon Posh to the checkered flag. And Jason Bridmore. It's Josh Heron who wins the Daytona 200 by seven hundredths of a second over Josh Hayes. Brandon Posh in third. Cameron Peterson fourth. Hayden Gillum in fifth. Blake Davis will be credited with sixth place. P.J. Jacobson in seventh, Teague Hobbs in eighth, Jeff May ninth, and Danny Eslick in tenth spot.
Wow. How close do you like that? Josh Heron played that to perfection. After being penalized, six grid spots on the restart, Heron able to get it done. Another heartbreak for oh my God, I feel so Josh, Josh Hayes. Hayes. Brandon Posh just always finds his way back to the front. Camp Peterson was there, but there's that run through the, you know, Heron got, got through the middle of the chicane. And you, like you say, he lost the front, got the thing sideways on the exit. Hayes wanted to lead out of there. That probably was what he, was what he thought, thought was going to be his best chance. And he ends up coming that close. Let's take another look at the finish, Jason. This is what seven hundredths of a second looks like. As they come through, look at the gap Hayes had. But man, the freight train is rolling. Yeah, and everybody behind is just trying to get into that spot. And right now, Posh is probably thinking it's going to be a repeat of last year. But Hammer is able to go by and go through. So that's as close as you like it. That's what at speed at 178 miles an hour looks like. And in the Warhorse HSBK Racing Ducati New York team and Ducati's second victory ever in 81 years at Daytona and their first at full race distance. We'll find out how that race went and more when we come back from this break. As Josh Heron and that Warhorse Racing Ducati NYC bike are under celebration mode here. Look at the fist pump, the wave to the crowd, an unbelievable finish here. Uh, looking at the monitor, the top six covered by less than two tenths of a second, Roger. Just incredible. And uh, as you were watching this, uh, this race unfold, uh, it looked to me like Heron's strategy from the off was to be aggressive, get to the front, make everybody chase after him, and uh, that red flag Comes back, gets the win with that long toe. I thought Hayes had it with that run through the uh, chicane, but Heron uh, had just enough. Yeah, he had just enough. And I mean, going into the race, you know, working with Josh, he was talking about he wants to be aggressive. But the main thing, trying to tell him it's a long race, be patient, don't get flustered. And even with that red flag, he, having a 23 second lead taken away, I mean, that that's, that's going to sting with five laps to go. So, uh, he remained calm, but, man, that could have been anybody's race. That was crazy. And Blake Davis. What a run. What a ride for Blake Davis. That was, that was awesome. Yeah, it was. Uh, just to see him just picking people I mean, off and coming up through. All those guys. I mean, Jeff May one time looked like he got into about second or third going yeah. into turn one. Danny Eslick. It's crazy. Teague Hobbs looked like he had a really good run going. Then he had to stand the bike up at one point, and that's what had him drop off the order just a little bit. But just unbelievable. And wow, you can imagine the celebrations that's going to go on down there. Josh Heron is just giving it some serious twist. Look at that. There's a celebratory burnout for the ages, no question about that. Second win. For Josh Heron, he he joins that group of multiple winners in the Daytona 200. Uh, man, he earned it. There's no question about that. It was a hard-fought race. Uh, but I'll tell you, you know, talking with uh, with Josh Hayes uh, when he came up for one of our our uh, coffee with Creamer and Hayes segments, I asked him about his line, that tight line through the chicane. And he said, don't be talking about that. I don't want to be giving it away. Uh, but he said it's smoother, and if you get the approach right, you come out of there so fast, and it looked like that run had it for him. I think that was Josh's only chance, really. Yeah. We were watching people drafting at the line. You never really seen him making a move at, at the stripe. Like right. He was drafting by the group. So I think for him, his best chance was what he did. Yep. And he was a bike length from it working perfectly. You know, got to <laughs> yeah. drive through there. And I think one yep. thing he was wanting to get through there so quick, too, yeah. to force the other guys to try to get a really good drive yep. so they make a little bit of a mistake. And it looked like it was going to work to perfection. And just uh, Josh just barely got in that draft, and then that was it. That was it. Now, the question I have is when we watch those replays, you can see that Josh Hayes was like three, four feet off of the uh, of the double yellow line and that's where Josh Heron went. You think if Josh had to go Heron had to go around the outside, that would have made a difference? Possibly. I mean, who but, knows? But yeah. when somebody's coming with with that much speed, you know, high or low, I've seen yep. it done both ways. Yep. That was just absolutely incredible. I mean, Cameron Peterson, uh, you know, basically getting that full all the laps 
down getting erased and giving Cameron Peterson with those fresh tires. He was right up in that mix as well. Uh, man, I tell you, I saw Josh. They had a shot of him coming down into the pits as we're watching Josh Heron here uh, just really celebrating, obviously. But Josh Hayes coming into the pits, arm on the tank, and just kind of went by and just kind of did the old wrist flick like, what, you know, what can you yeah, do? Yeah, I mean, he did all he could. <laughs> yeah. And, it, I mean, it's got a sting to be that close to winning the Daytona 200 and think that you had it. Yeah. I mean, he is so close to the stripe. Yep. He probably thinks, I got it. And then next thing you know. Yeah, I got it. I got it. I don't got it. Uh, and then P.J. Jacobson, uh, you know, had that off early. Uh, just got back on, stayed with it, fought after it, got that red flag, got the reset. He ends up in the top five. Yeah, and the, I don't know what happened with the, my screen here. Maybe Blake still got his penalty possibly and Brandon Posh. It shows on the bottom of the screen, bike 22-96 well, with the 15-second penalty. I don't know if that's accurate. So, uh, yeah, so... So Brandon Posh is going to end up uh, 12th. Blake Davis still uh, 11th. But regardless, both those two are great. Oh, you don't get on the podium. Yeah. I mean, I think Brandon here, he just wants to win, or yeah. it doesn't really matter to him. But for yeah. Blake, boy, he has to have some confidence leaving here. No kidding. I mean, the speed he was showing, the racecraft he was showing was superb. The Daytona 200 is brought to you by Bridgestone Tire, Bridgestone Solutions for your journey, and by Pirelli Tire. Pirelli, power is nothing without control. Here's how the Daytona 281st edition finished. Jason Fridmore, it was Josh Heron, seven hundredths of a second. That's .070 seconds faster than Josh Hayes. And let's not forget that Brandon Posh, who finished third across the line, had a 15-second penalty, so he's moved to 12th. And so here's a look at our final five finishers. So in this order, it was Heron Hayes, Cameron Peterson in third spot, Hayden Gillum, and P.J. Jacobson. And let's get down to Hannah, who has our winner, Josh Heron. Josh Heron, your 2023 Daytona 200 champion. Josh, crazy unfolding of events out there. Take us through that restart. You started from seventh. How were you able to make your way to the front? And what was your strategy to really utilize that draft and come out on top with this victory? Yeah, that was uh, that was hard. I wasn't expecting there to be a 10 lap restart with four laps to go after that. All that hard work with the team to get those good pit stops. Um, pass on Richie. I was just trying my hardest to try and line him up and get, uh, get something good going for the end of the race. It's unfortunate that he went down. I never want to do that. Um, but, you know, we got our penalty. We started seventh. It was really hard. I didn't know who was on the lead lap, who wasn't on the lead lap, because I was told some guys had penalties and some were laps behind. So it was, it was really strange racing. So uh, going into the chicane, I knew my only shot, because Josh was kind of a sitting duck, didn't have as much power as a lot of these guys. So my only chance was to try and give him a gap, exit in the chicane, and it ended up working perfectly. I couldn't have timed it any better. I uh, got to give a huge hats off to the entire Warhorse HSBK Racing, the Cotty New York team. They, uh, they worked so hard. Last year was so, so terrible to, to lose a race that way. And, uh, you know, I'm just uh, super grateful to be up here, super happy to finally get a Rolex after trying for 15 years. Um, huge shout out to Fresh and Lean, OnlyFans, Alpine Stars, uh, Insta360, Rye Helmets, Alpine Stars Leathers, everybody who's involved in making this program work. It's, uh, it's a dream come true to end the uh, Super Sport Championship with a bang like this and now go ride that 240-horsepower 240 V4R. From pole position to your Daytona 200 champion, Josh Heron, guys. Unbelievable. What a way to finish this race, 10-lap sprint race. And Jason used to get a Rolex for pole position. Now yeah. you get one for winning. Yeah, and that's going to be a nice little addition to the trophies and things that he has, Greg. And you can see... You know, he's, uh, he's still the wheelie king, obviously. But, uh, <laughs> you know, to, to get that Rolex and win here at Daytona is always special. Well, it wasn't without drama. This race will be talked about for years to come. 
about the restart of the race and everything that happened. But one thing we know for sure, it was certainly entertaining. The Daytona 200 did it again. Fred Bird and our crew, Jason Pridmore and Hannah Lopez, I'm Craig White. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next year.